that we're getting this, that we're seeing his life, we're seeing his heart demonstrated and made known. Hallelujah. Jesus said, every veil has been removed in Christ. Every veil, everything that would separate us from seeing the great physician. It's like we get to go see the doctor. Yeah. We're seeing the Lord high and lifted up. And as we see the Lord high and lifted up, his anointing, his fragrance, his his DNA is is just flowing in this place right now. Can we lift up our hands again? Amen. And just bless the Lord. I'm a worship leader, but I'm a worshiper. And and I want to just I want to just give honor to the Lord where honor is due. And he's the one who's worthy. And Lord, we give you all the praise. Thank you, Lord. Come on, just with your own words. Just just with your own words. Your own heart. Give the Lord praise today. Thank Him for what He's already done in you you. and and is doing through you to the glory of God. Lord, we honor you. We honor you in this moment, Lord. We take a moment just to say, You are exalted, Jesus. You are exalted. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, we're going to have our prayer ministers come at this time and and minister and uh, we know it's lunchtime and we're going to dismiss you for lunch, but we want to have a moment where we can literally just take our prayer, uh, our time to minister to you. So if you feel like you need some more time to be ministered to, that's what these prayer ministers are here for. Amen. And so again, you just need to know that we're not afraid of mess. We're not afraid of of taking time. We want to invest. We want to take time. We want to give freely of what has been freely given to us. So again, that that is the body of Christ. That is the heart of the Father. So even during lunch today, as you're having conversation and says, someone says something to you, you know, minister to them even over a lunchtime. Can the Lord heal during lunch? Why not? Can he heal tonight? Can he heal? The truth is he's already done what needed to be done. He's just waiting for you to have your moment when you're ready to receive. Amen. So grab somebody's hand real quick and I'm going to dismiss you. And then we're going to uh, have just a time of ministry for our, uh, our people who want to receive further ministry. Father, in Jesus' name, we just want to give you praise. We want to thank you for what you've done. We want to thank you, Lord God, for the power of God that is in demonstration. For the power of God that is available to every believer in this time, in this now, in this present tense. And God, we give you all the praise. Thank you for our workshops this afternoon. Thank you for Jerry ministering tonight. Lord God, we have great expectation and we give you all the glory. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. We will see you this afternoon. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us today on Gospel Truth TV with Andrew and Friends. If you were blessed or want additional information, simply go to our website at awmi.net or call us at 719-635-1111. You will discover resources that will build your faith and transform your life forever. If you would like to help Andrew bring this message of God's unconditional love and grace to the world, contact us today. Together, we are changing people's lives and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ to the world.
there was a kidney transplant, she couldn't because her heart wasn't strong enough. A spoonful of food, she would throw that up. And I was just literally watching my wife just wither away. The doctors are trying to help, but they're failing miserably, and we just didn't know what to do either. And I just decided, I just said, Lord, in Jesus' name, I'm going to eat. Now that my wife hasn't had anything really to eat in eight, nine years, but she started consistently eating. I went back to see the doctor three months later and he was astounded. Through Karis Bible College, the friends and partners of Andrew Womack Ministries are making disciples who are going out and changing the world. Disciples like Joseph and Eva Sederstrom, a Polish couple from Monument, Colorado, who thought they'd be spending the rest of their lives retiring in their dream home. Eva and I were just living life as retired people. We had a house and the house was really pretty. But this was our dream house. As we were driving to that house, there was a kind of a hill we had to go through. And every time we would go on that hill, we could actually see the valley where our house was. And we used to go into that hill and we would say, that's where the love begins. This is our little paradise. One day, Eva was on the treadmill exercising and flipping channels. And I stopped at Gospel Truth program. And he was teaching at that time on the authority of the believer and my jaw just dropped and she said to me listen to this guy and what he's talking about and I watched with her and we were captivated by the topic and then the next day we watched Andrew again and every day for about a week we were we were watching and then we went to the web and we found out that we could download teachings and so Joseph and I, we bought ourselves iPods. I kid you not, we were sometimes 18 hours a day. Joseph was doing his thing, I was doing my thing, walking around, traveling, everything. Andrew, Andrew, Andrew. Sometimes we would just talk to each other. What did you say? Uh-huh, okay, and back to Andrew. It was crazy. We were just like, we couldn't get enough. We went to campus days, and 
we were amazed. We had chance to hear some other teachers and we knew when this was over that we need to come back in September and start school. We didn't come with big plans, we just were selfishly wanting to get some answers and we wanted to have knowledge of the Bible and have a relationship with God. So it was very self-centered. But through the years, something changed. We come up with so much word in us and we got all this love and, and, and the knowledge and, and we, we have grown, we had to give it away. As Joseph and Eva sat under God's word, the appeal of retirement diminished beneath the desire to raise disciples. Between their second and third school year, God began calling them to start a Karis campus in a place near to their hearts, yet far from home. At the Family Bible Conference, I was listening to Wendell speak. And Wendell was preaching out of Matthew 28 and Mark 16. And I only wrote one note was, go. I knew immediately where we were supposed to go. The Lord started talking to us and uh, saying that uh, we're going to go to Poland. With a trembling heart, I said, send us wherever you want to. We want to do things for you. One day we were driving and we went to that hill and the love wasn't there. It was just like, it's just a valley, it's just a house. And we said like, oh my gosh, you know, it doesn't really matter. None of those things matter. We finished the third year, June of 2010. September of 2010, loaded our car packed with books and clothes and cooking supplies and that, loaded it onto a container to be shipped to Poland and we were flying the next day. When we came to Poland and we started school, it was really a miracle that we had any students, to be honest with you. We did not have connections with churches, with people who want to sponsor us. It was totally pioneer working. We didn't know in the Holy Spirit, the Lord was showing us step by step, step by step. He said, I will bring you students. The very first year we had almost 30 students. They came out of the woodwork. We were just amazed. And from that beginning, Joseph and Eva continued to fulfill God's calling of making disciples in Poland, which included translating Andrew's books and the Karis Bible College curriculum. The fruit of their labor was evident at the Gospel Truth Rally of 2015, where Andrew taught at a venue so packed he needed Karis Poland to run the prayer lines. I think this visit of Andrew cemented in them that he's making disciples. He spoke to our students at graduation. We had 16 students graduate this year. He said, you are disciples. He says, this school is about making disciples. Having an experience ourselves to see what the school was really doing in our lives and how it prepared us to take that message further. It's obviously Andrew's heart to make disciples and we are the very product of that. Joseph and Eva's story is just one of the many that our friends and partners have made possible through the support of Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College. Because of you, Poland is now being set to blaze with the truth of the finished work of Jesus. Because of you, Karis students are healing the sick and raising the dead. Because of you, a Polish couple from Monument, Colorado have discovered a much more fulfilling destiny than retiring in their dream home. I'd like to encourage you to call in. And I know that God is speaking to many, many people. And you may have had the Lord touch you today. And if you just need somebody to touch and agree with you, the scripture says, if any two of you agree touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father. So we have these people, I mean powerful people who love God and are equipped in the Word of God. They're there to pray with you and help you. The number is 719-635-1111. That's 719-635-1111.
This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. Really what God is looking for is you. They gave of themselves to the Lord first. God doesn't first of all want your money. He wants you. If he has you, he has your money. And if he has you, then you're the one who really are, is that steward between God and your money. God didn't want to just reach over here and take your money from you. He wants you to give it willingly. And if you give what you give willingly, that's the first thing God's looking for, is a willing heart. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Good morning and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. This is our fourth day teaching on the subject of a time to prosper. The time to prosper is now. Any day is a good day to start. It's not something, well, I'll start next week. Maybe God will. No, no, we're going to talk about it today. Today is the day to make the decision. If today is the day of salvation, then if you haven't accepted Jesus, why wait till next week? You're not even assured of next week. You're assured of this moment right now to accept him. If you're sick, the time to be, start your healing is not today. Jesus died for it back there and is waiting today. It says today is the day for healing. So quit waiting till tomorrow. Make this the day when you decide today this thing is over. Today I face this cancer. I face this disease. I face this this massive thing or the small things. I'm tired of putting up with it. Father, I'm today. Today is the day. And right now we make the decision. The day, today is the day to prosper. A time to prosper is also, again, not just today, but also a time period of prosperity. We're going to talk about the growth of prosperity because it is a prosperous journey. The word for prosperity in the New Testament actually means a prosperous journey. And this means that, journey, that prosperity is a journey, just like uh, discipleship is a journey. Growing in the things of God, maturing in the things of God is a process that lasts all your lifetime. So is healing and so is walking with God and his prosperous uh, outpouring into our life. And so the thing that God wants is to bring possessions into our life, but for the right reasons. We've talked about that. So again, we're going to talk about that today. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to take a look at verses 1 through 5. Then we're going to go to verse 9. While you're finding that, again, let me just reiterate for all those who are watching, I have so much on my website, bobyandian.com. There's just so much there. Things that you can download, things that you can read. There's also things you can order, all types of things that are on there. Send in your prayer request, uh, questions that you have. There's a place there you can send in your questions. Again, I just delight in hearing from you. But the other part is, I also delight in those who respond, not only by the, by the praise report, reports they send in and think, you know, thank you for the work. It changed my life and all this. But also when people say, not only have you blessed me, I want to be a blessing to you. And so you respond by supporting me. You send in financial blessings. Some of you from time to time send in finances, but there's also a group of you who have dedicated yourself to monthly giving. And this is what helps bring bring us through these time periods. And I know back when we went through the COVID time, there are people that, that, that continued supporting. And honestly, our support just maintained itself during that time period. Thank you for being faithful. And this is just true all the time. Those who help support it bring stability into our life. You say, well, you know, aren't we supposed to trust God for our stability? The answer is yes. But even Jesus had a group of people around him. And in one case, a group of women, they were mentioned by name, who... Uh, uh, these women, and many were single, but also others were housewives. They gave into Jesus' ministry, and the point of it was it helps to understand and know I have a base of support that's going to help me. Thank you in your giving for that. So there's a place on my website, bobyandian.com, where not only can you receive, uh, you know, teachings and all this other stuff, but you can give into me and into my ministry. And so thank you for that, a place where you can become a partner. And so please go there and do that. And I want to thank you ahead of time. Thank you for becoming a partner with me. Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're starting out again in verses 1 through 5. Today I want to talk about in here, what is God looking for when you give? Okay, I mean, I brought out before, he wants you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Your neighbors, yourself. And 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3 says, If I give even to the poor all my possessions and my body to be burned, but don't have love, 
it profits me nothing. We are told throughout the word of God that giving is supposed to profit you, but you don't give for the profit. You give because of the motive. I love the Lord. I love people. I want to be a blessing to God's kingdom. So by being a blessing to God's kingdom, I want to be a blessing to God's people and to the people of the world. I want to give so that people can find Jesus as Savior. I want to give to those who have received Jesus as Savior so they can become disciple in the things of God. And this is where God said, stand back. I'm going to pour out heaven's riches on you because you're the one I've been looking for. The Old Testament said, when you come in the promised land, he said, don't forget the Lord your God. He said, for it's he that gives prosperity, and he gives it to those who favor his righteous cause. His righteous cause is souls. And he wants to establish his covenant in this earth through people who are givers of the blessings that are in this earth. We receive them for a while while we live in this earth. We don't take our riches to heaven. We don't take the gold to heaven, our cars, our homes, and all that stuff. But what happens is when we use our possessions to give back into God's kingdom, we, in essence, become the filter to where the wealth of the world now becomes into the hand of the just. We give it to just men missionaries and just churches and those that represent the righteousness of God, those presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ and the message of the word. Second Corinthians chapter eight, we'll start the chapter now, okay? Verse one, moreover, brothers, we remind you of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their generosity. One translation says liberality. For to their ability, I bear record, yes, and beyond their ability, they were willing of themselves, praying with us, which much entreaty, that when we receive the gift and take upon us the partnership of the ministering to the saints, and this they did, not as we hoped, but first they gave of themselves to the Lord, then to us by the will of God. Jump down to verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. In these verses, verse 1 and verse 9, both emphasize the grace of God when it comes to prosperity. That God does this out of his grace. Although it's our participation with him, it's our obedience to him, is that even though God blesses us with these things, it still comes from his grace. Everything comes from the grace. I like it this way. Faith is an empty hand reaching out to God, but grace is God's full hand reaching out to us. And God's full hand came before our empty hand. And he has a hand out there filled with all things that pertain unto life and godliness and wants us to reach out with our faith and take it. And part of faith is just that simple obedience to God. And God says, listen, if you'll understand that grace is what supplies for you, you'll understand that it really had nothing to do with your goodness and your ability. It simply had to do with your simple saying yes to the will of God. So in verse one and verse nine, prosperity is a grace received by faith. Prosperity does not come by our works any more than salvation or healing comes by our works. You don't have to give to get. This is not what God wants. So you don't give to get. You don't act righteous to be saved or jump out of bed to be healed. What do I mean by that? Works do not save us. Going to church will not save us. Being water baptized will not save us. Giving money and an offering will not save us. It's not by our works. But works should follow the grace of God. We are saved unto good works, but we receive salvation by grace. It, listen, I can't stop sinning and get saved, but I trust if I, you know, I get saved, I'll stop sinning. I don't have the power before I was born again to stop sinning. But even if I did, and I just gritted my teeth and started living a very moral life, morality will not save me. Hell will be filled with moral sinners, and it'll be filled with atrocious sinners, you know, those that lived ungodly lives. But heaven is going to be filled with moral people and immoral people. But they all had one thing in common. They received Jesus as Lord and Savior. So this verse is simply telling us that we are saved by grace. And the thief on the cross was saved by grace. Never did one good thing in his life that we're told of. And he just, he was a criminal. But on the cross, he received Jesus. And Jesus said, just before he died today, right now, you're going to be with me in paradise. You'll be with me in the kingdom of God. And so they went there, both Jesus and him. So you don't get righteous or you're not saved by, again, cleaning up your life. And next of all, you're not healed because you suddenly jump out of bed. 
And it's, in other words, it's not the action that did it. People say, well, I need to act like I'm saved. Well, that's act like I'm healed. That's true, but it's after you believe you're healed first. You believe, then you act on it. The same thing is true with salvation. I believe in Jesus, now I live like it. But I don't live like it so I can have it. No, I have it, then I live like it. I accept my healing, I believe I have it, then I act like it. The same is true with giving. You don't give to get. You give because you love the Lord. You give because you love people. And next of all, the reason why you give is because you believe you're prosperous. Here's the point. I believed I'm saved and I am saved. And so I act like it. I believe I'm healed and so I act like it. Now, if I accept the fact that I am prosperous, I believe I'm prosperous, now I act like it. I don't give to get. I give because I've already got it. I've already accepted Jesus Christ as my personal financial blessing, like I have my Savior and my healer. Now he's my financial provider. So giving should be a corresponding action to our faith, not a means of getting uh, wealth into my life. No, I give because I love the Lord. I give because I love people. And God says, now it's going to come to you. And so I can expect it. In verse two, we find out that what backs our giving is generosity. And again, from that verse of scripture in verse two, we are told there how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded on the riches of their generosity. Generosity should drive our giving. In other words, they were more generous than they were possessed. Of course, there's a certain amount of possessiveness we want to look at. We don't want to be wasteful in what God has given us. We want to, don't want to be base, wasteful with the possessions of life. But next of all, we look at our generosity should outweigh that. I look at that and I go, you know what? I'm going to give to God. I know, I, I, I know that I've got this amount of money, but you know what? I'm going to take a portion and give it to God. And I'm going to expect, I, in other words, how am I going to get out of this if I don't put seed in? But I'm not going to give seed just so I can get out of this. I'm going to give seed because I love God and I love people more than I love myself. I love God. And I love the people. And I want to see them saved and all that. I'm going to take a portion and give God said out of that. And notice this. They were blessed according to their generosity. Generosity, not circumstances. The joy and generosity exceeded their poverty. And this is why the Lord blessed, talked about saying about the woman who gave of the might, how that she gave more than anybody else. Why? Because she loved God and loved people. Next of all, it said they gave because they were willing to give. Willingness must, must come from the inside of us. They didn't, uh, they did not need to be provoked to give. In fact, they came prepared to give. I know every time I would receive an offering, I'd give a very small sermon on it. But I realized something. The sermon was for those of people that need to be talked into it. But there was a group of people that came to church ready to give. In fact, they already had their offering envelopes made out. They already had get, put their credit card numbers on there, or they already had, already had a check written on the inside of it, or they had cash on the inside of that offering envelope. They came prepared. They didn't even have to be. They came prepared to give. And that's what the Lord said here about this verse of Scripture. That they came and they were willing to give. And this is what God is looking for is a willing heart. They didn't lose their willingness by the next service. Their willingness was there every day of the week. Next of all, uh, they would give any time despite circumstances. You don't need for your pastor to give scriptures a pep talk because you came to church prepared to give. Oh, you might sit there and go, okay, pastor, thank you for this. I understand that verse of scripture. That's for him. That's for her, but not for me. Cause you know what? I came prepared to give. My heart came prepared to God to give. And God considers this the highest form of giving when you come prepared to give this series called A Time to Prosper can be yours. More than what I'm giving here is in there. And you're going to find out how you can have a copy for yourself. See you after the break. The Bible tells us that there is a season and a time for everything. As we rapidly approach the second coming of the Lord, we are entering a time and a season specifically appointed by God to reroute the flow of financial prosperity from the hands of the world into the hands of those who believe in Christ and look forward to His kingdom. This revealing eight-part Bible study will correct your misapprehensions about prosperity, focus your attention to what your attitude should be toward prosperity, how God views prosperity, and His purpose in giving you prosperity on the earth. Lessons include, It's the Will of God, Poverty is a Curse, How You Can Never Fail, Preserving Your Prosperity, Where Seed Comes From, How to Keep What God Gives, the unprofitable servant. To order a time to prosper, visit our website at bobbyendian.com. Bobby Indian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. 
Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Pastors, if you would like to schedule Bob Yandian to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to bobyandian.com forward slash invite. The last point we covered was in verse 3. They had a willingness to give. They said, the Lord said, but they gave willingly of themselves. Notice again, it starts with you. It comes back to this also that, you know, you're willing to give and God is not looking just for your money. He's looking for you. If you're willing to give, he has you. That's what he's wanting most of all. Does God need your money? No, he created all this. God could just suddenly have a meltdown of gold and what's being stored, you know, can, can suddenly Fort Knox can just come melting out the door and God just use it if he wanted to. But that's not the point. He prefers to use people. Because he doesn't, money is not just something that God sees as something here, just as some tangible thing to, to meet needs. No, he looks to us. He wants obedience. The most important thing is not the money. The most important thing is your attitude when you give the money. This is what God is looking for. Why did he make and bless Abraham? It says, I bless you because I knew you would be a blessing. And God looks and sees that generosity of the heart. In other words, when you have no money, I remember a story about a minister who told me when he first started, he said, man, he was in a service. He was so blessed by the service. He had no money, none. He said, I had nothing in my pocket. I was empty. My wallet was empty. My pocket was empty. He said, but I was going to get ready to take notes. He thought, you know what? I have this ink pen. I want to take notes, but you know what? I need, I need this ink pen, but I'm just going to put it in the offering. So he said, I took that offering envelope. And so I just took it and I said, I didn't even put my name on this. I was just so embarrassed. This is all I had to give. I dropped the ink pen in the offering envelope. And said, so I gave it. And he said, when it went by, he said, the guy sitting behind me saw me do that, reached in, took out another one and gave it to me. So he said, I had one to go. And he said, I thought, well, look at that. The Lord already supplied a, an ink pen back for me. I mean, the guy said, just keep it. And he said, so I used it through the service. On the way out the door, he said a total stranger came up to him, handed him an envelope and said, the Lord just told me to give this to you. He said, I opened it up and it had money on the inside of it. He said, I, he said, I didn't, right now, I don't even remember how much it was. But he said, it just so, I was overwhelmed. God met my need before I walked out the door and gave me extra. And this is what God does. Notice he started with what he had. And what he had didn't look like much. It was that widow's might. It's kind of like when Moses stood before the Lord with a rod in his hand and says, Lord, what, what do I have? I don't have anything. The Lord said, what do you got in your hand? I got this, this shepherd's staff. And he went on. God said, no, that's what we're going to use. He said, throw it down, turn loose of it. And the moment he did, it became a serpent. And God used that staff through all the miracles that he had. It simply comes down to this. You think you have nothing, but you always have something, something small. And it seems small to you. It's huge to God because it doesn't just represent an ink pen. It represents your faith, your abandonment of what little things you have that he can use. Again, we find they had a willingness that came, first of all, from themselves. Next of all, in verse four, they actually had to be constrained to quit giving. Paul said, I knew the condition they were in. I knew the hardship they were facing. I knew that out of a great trial of affliction, they were giving. He says, and I kept telling them, stop this. You know, guys, I appreciate it. He says, and what Paul was doing was this was his natural side coming out. The spiritual side of Paul said, said this. That's what they're doing. Quit trying to restrain them. He said, the natural side of me said, I understand. And yet they kept on giving. This is what happened back in the day when they built the tabernacle in the wilderness and uh, and and uh, Moses had to constrain the people. They had more than enough to build the tabernacle and, and finally Moses said, stop, stop, stop. But they just kept on giving and kept on giving. And this is what God is looking for. He's looking for a willingness of the heart. God's looking for willing people and so willing that again, they had to be constrained. Also in verse four, they partnered with Paul in his ministry. They said they fellowship, the, the, they took on him the fellowship. Actually, the Greek word there is partnership. Koinonia, although it does mean fellowship, means a partnership. And so uh, they partnered with him in the gospel. They partnered with him in grace. 
They partnered with him in suffering. They partnered with him in power. And they partnered with him in finances. All these things are brought out in the book of Philippians. Partnership is mentioned five times in the book of Philippians. The closest church that Paul had stuck with him. And this is who he's talking about. Those from Macedonia. This is the church of Philippi he's referring to here. And Paul said this was the church that stuck with him through all types of tribulations and trials. He valued the other churches, but these were the closest to him. And this is what I value in my ministry. Many of you are partners with me. And again, I want to thank you for standing with me in partnership. And just as he was saying here, you partnered with me. You don't just partner with a ministry. Bobby Andy Ministries is an organization. You partner with a person and you have partnered with me. I hold up my hand, you grab my hand and we're working together. And this is what Paul was saying. Paul so appreciated what these Philippians had done. He said, I stood there in awe at what they were doing. And I sometimes stand in awe at the letters I receive saying, I want to become a partner and here's what I want to give. And I'll tell you, my heart just goes out. And, and I finally say, Lord, we're doing well. And God says, I want to prosper even more because there's more more things I'm going to call you to do. And so again, thank you again for doing that. This is what the gratitude that Paul felt for them when again, they partnered with Paul in his ministry in verse four. Verse five, they gave of themselves, first of all, to the Lord. Notice this. They didn't give their money first. They gave themselves to the Lord. Really what God is looking for is you. They gave of themselves to the Lord first. God doesn't first of all want your money. He wants you. If he has you, he has your money. And if he has you, then you're the one who really are, is that steward between God and your money. God didn't want to just reach over here and take your money from you. He wants you to give it willingly. And if you give what you give willingly, that's the first thing God's looking for is a willing heart. So they gave themselves first to the Lord. Again, God would rather that your money be given willingly. And God indicates, or giving indicates that God has you, not just your money, and indicates that God has you, not the fact that you just have money. No, what it comes down to this is the greatest possession I have in life is the fact I'm a child of God. I gave my life to Jesus Christ and I have possessed eternal life. Everything from that point on is just gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. And I want to take what's what I see as mine and realize it's only mine for while I'm here. I'm just using this money. I didn't bring any money into this earth. I'm not going to take any money out. It's kind of like the story when this very wealthy, wealthy, wealthy man died. I mean, a multimillionaire, perhaps a billionaire. This is a true story. They stood around his casket and somebody said, wow, how much did he leave behind? And somebody said, all of it. <laughs> That's exactly true. We come time saying, wow, what kind of wealth did this guy leave back here? Well, he never owned it in the first place. We only are, are stewards of it. And even a sinner doesn't own the money. It's here when he got here. It was just transferred. And so really what happens with wealth is it's just an accumulation of part of what's already here brought over to us. And we use it when we die. It's part of the world system again. Or the good thing is we can leave some to our kids and our children's children and uh, make a blessing for them. But again, what God's looking for them and them is the same thing. They stand before Mount Gerasim and Ebal also in each generation saying, you know, it's up to me to keep following God, bless him, or else just look at myself and figure out how to bless myself. If I bless God, I'll have plenty for the rest of my life, enough to hand on to my children and my children's children. But if I don't, I'll lose it all. And that's what God is saying. So we still need to keep that accountability inside of ourselves. And again, they first of all gave of themselves to the Lord. Next of all, in verse 9, Prosperity is part of the atoning work of Jesus on the cross. I know this rubs people so when they say, you mean money was one of the reasons Jesus died on the cross? The answer is yes. An ability to use the money to send it out to the rest of the world. Again, what God is looking for is servants. We want to become a servant of God. More than being a child of God, I also want to be a servant of the Lord. I don't want to just stand there as a child and say, I'm a child of God. I also want to say, Lord, I've made myself a bond servant to you. And I, just like Paul would not introduce himself as just a righteous man, he introduced himself as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Timothy is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and Titus is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to become a voluntary servant of him. In so doing that, again, 
Jesus died on the cross so that I can have prosperity, so I can fulfill many things in the Christian life. Money helps us fulfill the will of God. Because he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, but that's not for one person to do. That's for a multitude of us to do. But also to take our finances and send it. It's like sending our servant into the world. I'm the Lord's servant, but I got a servant under me. And that servant under me obeys me like I obey God. And I tell that money, I, you know, I write on that envelope and send out, this is going to a brother so-and-so who's in Zimbabwe. And he's going to preach the gospel there. My money, in essence, goes to Zimbabwe. It can work day and night, okay? It doesn't gripe. It doesn't complain. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't uh, come and strike against me and, and want to do all these things. No, no, it works. It just goes to work. It never goes to sleep. So day and night it's working all the time. And this is that perfect servant. Doesn't take holidays, doesn't need to sleep, doesn't need to rest. It just keeps on working. And this is what God looks when he sees money. But he wants us to understand instead of having it work for me all the time and sit in an account somewhere and buy me a new car, those things are fine. But he want to first of all seek the kingdom of God and then all these other things will be added unto me. So prosperity is part of the atonement. Prosperity comes from the earth through men. And so salvation, divine healing, they also come from heaven, but prosperity, these things we find, first of all, let me get back to this again. Let me emphasize this. My salvation comes from heaven, okay? My healing comes from heaven, but finances are different. Even though it's part of the atoning work of Jesus, prosperity comes from the earth and it comes to me like water. You know, there's always water in the earth and the water is in the earth. The thing about water is this, there's never any more water added or water taken away. The water that's here has always been here and water just simply recycles all the time. It's in the ocean, it evaporates, goes up and makes clouds, clouds come over the land, it rains and the rain runs back into the ocean and the whole process starts all over again. And so there's never gonna be more water in this earth. What's here has always been here, but next of all, we can't destroy it. It can evaporate and go back up. It changes, but it's always usable. What do you do when you need water? If there's a stream over here, you build your house by a stream, but you take part of that stream, you dig it out, you bring it over to your house and you build yourself a pond here and that's for you. When it comes to prosperity, it's already in the earth. You just need to dig a trough over to you and have that water start coming to you. How do you dig a trough? You start serving God. And it's like digging a trough and the, and the prosperity that's in this earth starts to come over you and you use it. Again, it was here before you came. It'll be here after you're gone. It doesn't increase or decrease the amount of prosperity that's in this earth. Again, we keep finding more of it, but it's just here in this earth all the time. And God placed it here at the time of Adam and Eve. Money flows through us. And then the good thing is, is it flows to us, but also returns back to us. Our financial blessings come from God, but God has placed it here in the earth. And so it's up to us to learn how to bring it to us. Old financial coins are still here. They're an example. They've always been around. You have an old pro a coin. I had coins for a while that was here before I was ever born. But you know what? The, the silver that was in it was always here. And the point of it is, is prosperity has always been here. It's up to us to reach out there and bring it into our life. And so what are the results of a, of a willing giver? Every man is he purposes in his heart, so let him give. Not grudging or necessity, God loves a cheerful giver so that we can give into every good work. What is God's plan for us? All the good works around us can be a blessing, and we can give into every one of those. Be sure and get this series for yourself. I'll see you tomorrow as we wrap up this series on an appointed time to prosper. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian. Ready to get more out of God's Word than ever before? We gladly announce the newly recreated Andrew Womack Living Commentary. Study with Andrew from Genesis to Revelation. This living commentary is packed with a lifetime of Andrew's own footnotes on over 32,000 verses and counting. This extensive living commentary contains multiple translations of the Bible, 
including the King James Version Plus, along with Strong's Concordance, where you can find the original Greek and Hebrew text. Andrew has also provided you with several historically respected commentaries. It's never been easier for you to study through the Bible with Andrew. Priced at only $120, this continuously updated living commentary is now available exclusively as a download for both Mac and Windows at awmi.net. Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I'm glad that you're watching our Gospel Truth TV. I tell you, this has been a blessing. You know, if you are being touched by these programmers that we have on here, I would encourage you to support them. Did you know we don't charge any of the programmers? If you appreciate that, I encourage you to be a part of it. Join us, support Gospel Truth TV, and also support the programmers. Karen Conrad serves as Vice President of Wealth Builders. She is a consultant, teacher, author, and maintains a successful real estate and home staging business that has been featured on the Lifetime Television Network. Welcome to Living with Karen Conrad. Thank you for joining me. It's Living with Karen Conrad. We are in a series called Only Believe. I'm just so excited to get right back into the Word today. Do you know, yesterday we were teaching on uh, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, and I only got through verse 1, and so we've got a ways to go. Um, but I'll tell you what, I'm just, I'm just so excited about the Word, and I know that sounds maybe funny, like, oh, of course, Karen. But, you know, as we get in and we really dig into these scriptures, I love how God knew everything that we need. And he has certainly given us good guidance on how to live a life of faith. Now, it does require commitment. It does require making good choices. But I'll tell you what, when we humble ourselves under the word of God, we are able to walk in faith and live a life of faith, knowing that he has given us everything that we need to live that life successfully. So I'm just going to review that first verse, and if you want more in-depth on it, just watch the program from yesterday. But Hebrews 12, 1, again it says, Therefore then, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who have bore testimony to the truth, let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance, unnecessary weight, and that sin which is readily, deftly, and cleverly clings to and entangles us. You know, we need to cut some things loose in our life. We need to let go of some things. And uh, a lot of that might be just the way that we view ourselves. It might be things that we've done wrong. That might be things that other people have done to. I mean, we just meditating on things that are negative and don't reflect who we are in Christ. Those are the types of things that can really stop us from running our race. And I believe that's a lot of what we are talking about here. Uh, and he says, and let us run with patience and endurance and steady and active persistence, the appointed course of the race that is set before us. Well, we don't like to sometimes to talk about, about patience and endurance an active persistence, but that is what is required in our life. You know, we will have days we're discouraged. Get ourselves up, get with God, and get help to run our race. We do it with patience. It might not go as fast as what we want. We have to endure hardship at times. We have to be active in persistence. That means just because something didn't go the way we thought it wanted to, we wanted it to go or the way that we thought it should, we don't just give up. What I have found is that people that have had an incredible impact in this world, and of course, Andrew Womack is one of the greatest examples I can think of. When you visit with him, or when you hear him talk about what he went through 
to be where he is today, I can tell you he had to run with patience, endurance, steady, and active persistence. And there's a funny thing about that. Do you know, when you do what God's called you to do, you have to understand that you will meet resistance. The other thing that we need to understand is even though it's big in our hearts, it might not be big in other people's hearts, what God has called us to do. So we have to guard ourselves against discouragement. I feel that's one of the biggest weights that people have is discouragement. They know what God's called them to do. We know what that looks like, but we end up with uh, things happening in our life that kind of war against that and actually try to paint a picture in our heart and mind that what God told us is not possible. That's where that patience and endurance and making the decision, do you know what, God? I have dedicated my life to you. And I am willing to go through and endure what I need to to fulfill the call that you have in my life. Nobody likes to receive criticism. Nobody likes other people telling them that their idea is crazy, that, you know, doubting that there's a, an amazing plan for their life. There's even some kids whose parents speak that to them. That is not good. But when we decide that we have turned ourselves over to God, when we have dedicated our life, to live out the purpose that he has for our life. And we do not waver with that. I want to encourage you, the grace is there. You can do it. God is there to strengthen you. But don't let those things stop you from running your race. They are meant to stop you. Criticism is meant to derail you from doing what God has called you to do. The word tells us that the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. Sometimes we think that it's our job to speak negative about a situation that we don't agree with. But the word tells us when we do that, when we speak against the brethren, we are being used by the enemy. That is never God, okay? So if you even are going through something where other people are criticizing you or talking against you, just forgive them and know that that is just the enemy. He's a liar. A lot of times when I look at things, I, this sounds simple, but it's helped me a lot. When I go through things where the circumstances, there's a lot of pressure and, um, Maybe I have thought of, of negative things, fearful things. Um, you're never going to make it. You're going to fail. Uh, I remind myself that the only thing that, that Satan can do is lie. Do you know that? He has no truth in him. So if those thoughts, if the words that you are hearing from other people... If they do not line up with what God says about you, you can quickly discard them and know, oh my goodness, that's a lie. I don't even need to give that any more thought because there is no truth in the enemy. All he can do is lie to you. And it sort of clears things out for me because if I know that, for example, if a uh, And I'm like, oh my goodness, my knee hurts. Oh, I wonder if I did something. Ooh, I wonder if it might be a problem with cartilage. You know, your mind just goes, just tries to go all the way over here. And then I realize, wow, that is totally against the word of God. The word of God tells me that by his stripes, I was healed. So that's only the enemy lying with those thoughts because all he can do is lie. So get out. In the name of Jesus, I'm not accepting those lies. I am healed. Knee, be healed in Jesus' name. Pain, go. 
but it all starts with exalting the word of God over the lies of this world and the lies of the enemy. Okay, so that's an example, honestly, of patience and endurance. So I may have symptoms for a couple days, but I am standing on the word, right? Patience and endurance to receive the prize, to receive what the word of God says about me. Amen. All right, let's go on to verse two. Again, this is in the Amplified. It says, looking away from all that will distract to Jesus. Okay, so on your phones, right? On Facebook, is there some distraction there? Absolutely. I'm not saying that Facebook's bad. I'm on Facebook, I'm on social media and all those things, and I try to be a blessing on there. But there are things that you can get caught up and all once you're wasting time and you realize, oh my goodness, this actually is feeding me things that's against the word of God. That's what the news is doing. That's called propaganda, trying to get us to fear. But here it says we need to look away from all that will distract to Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith giving the first incentive for our belief and you're ready for this and is also its finisher praise god bringing it to maturity and perfection i'll tell you what this verse preaches because when we're in the midst of things and we are applying the principles of faith okay and and we're feeling weak Maybe it's like that situation I was explaining to you when I, I had a um, health issue that was just, uh, you know, it wasn't lining up with what the Word of God said about me. I was weak. My husband had just passed away. I was not at a point of strength in my life, okay? This verse carried me through because I had to take and put my trust that the faith in me is of Jesus Christ, okay? So in here it says, not only is he the leader and the source of my faith, but he is also the finisher, bringing it to maturity and perfection. I'll tell you what, this is a peaceful, blessed life when we live in these verses. So when we apply our faith, when we choose to only believe the word over circumstances, okay? We can know that he is the source of our faith, so we don't have to rely on ourselves, but also that he will finish it, bring it to maturity and perfection. Wow, what are you believing God for? What has God spoken to you that you know that you know you are called to do, but you just haven't been able to endure? You just haven't been able to stay on that path of your race. Turn it over to Jesus. Let him know that you receive that the faith in you is of him, and that faith is perfect. And then let him know that you are going to keep your mind on the word you are going to just out of faith only believe what he is and what he says and remind him that he is the one that will bring it to maturity and perfection isn't that awesome news certainly we need to cooperate with him but we are in that position of faith when we know that our success is absolutely imminent because it's not dependent on us, it's dependent on Him, we can so much better, easier to hear His voice, to take those steps, to not waver because we put our confidence in Him and taken that pressure off us. You know, we are human. Yes, we are only human, but we have Jesus Christ on the inside of us. We have the creator of the universe on the inside of us. When we stop de depending on this shell, <laughs> on, a, on this person that we are, and we 
meditate on, we acknowledge, we speak forth that the greater one is in us. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen. Also, he tells us that nothing is impossible with God. He's not saying we can do it on our own. He doesn't want us to do it on our own. Nothing is impossible with God. Wow, we are world changers. We can do anything that God puts on our heart to do. So let's continue here. So he says this, he for the joy of obtaining the prize that was set before him endured the cross, despising and ignoring the shame and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you know, when Jesus endured the cross, we talked in the show yesterday about how he had to have faith in the Father that truly that he would ascend to heaven and sit at the right hand and that what he went through on the cross would save you and save me. The Bible gives us insight into what Jesus went through before he took that cross and went through all the scourging and all the way to being crucified. Jesus exercised his faith in the Father. And he was able to do that because he knew him. He knew his nature. He knew his Father. He trusted the Father that if he would endure what he did, that he would obtain the prize. Do you know what that prize is? That prize is you and that prize is me. My goodness, we are Jesus' prize. We are so special to him. So he goes on to talk here in there that he endured the cross, despising and ignoring the shame. You know, I hadn't really thought about the shame that would go with something like that. He was scourged in front of people laughing at him. You know, sometimes we're laughed at, or maybe someone makes fun of us or our children, uh, or maybe something happens to us that we just feel so shameful about. He ignored the shame and despised it. That means that you and I can do the same. He paid the price for that. We can let that go. We can cut that weight off and go forward to run our race. And he says, and he is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And you and I are seated with him. When he ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, he brought you and I with him. Praise God. All right, so verse 3 says this, Just think of him who endured from sinners such grievous opposition and bitter hostility against himself. Reckon up and consider it in all in comparison with your trials, so that you may not grow weary or exhausted, losing heart and fainting in your minds. This is a really, really powerful verse. So really what he's telling us is that when we go through difficult times, when we have things in our life that are very, very difficult, especially when people maybe hurt us or um, harm us, he tells us here to think of him who endured all that he endured on the cross. Sometimes when uh, I might be tempted to harbor um, unforgiveness, or if I'm ministering or talking to someone that's got that bitter root in them, sometimes what I'll just remind them is like, you know what, I know, or I'm talking to myself, I know it was difficult. I know 
that it hurts. But is it bigger than what Jesus did for you? Or did for that person? And it really kind of just brings me back to the reality like, wow, if I think what's happening to me is bigger than what Jesus did on the cross, if I think what that person said about me is bigger than what Jesus did on the cross, that is not good. And it brings me right back to the point of that eternally minded. And it's like, you know what? Thank you, Lord. I needed that correction. Whatever has happened to me or whatever I have done that I keep playing in my mind that's wrong is not bigger than what Jesus did. You know, a lot of people feel that it's godly or holy to beat themselves up about things or to criticize themselves. We're taught in the world that humility is kind of saying, you know, I'm not worth anything. Really, that's the opposite of humility. Because if you understand what Jesus did for you, okay, the price that he paid, he made you righteous. He made you royal. Whatever you did is not bigger than what Jesus did. So stop condemning yourself. Stop being ashamed. Let that go and exalt the word over that shame, that guilt. Exalt what Jesus did on the cross above any circumstance you're facing. A lot of people have trouble forgiving themselves. It's probably one of the biggest weights that I see because in the church when we know the truth and we see how we lived our life, that shame and that guilt will try to cling to us. And it does so like the word says very cleverly. That's when we choose to only believe what God says about us. So look at that cross and make the decision that the price that Jesus paid was enough for you and for others. We're going to let it go and we are going to receive that life. He said here that he, um, he said, who endured from sinners such grievous opposition and bitter hostility against himself. Do you know, that's what's happening in the world today. If you even watch the news and you see what's coming against even President Trump on a daily basis, that is absolutely grievous opposition and bitter hostility. So we live through that. And sometimes, unfortunately, it comes from other Christians. But again, he gives us the tool here to be able to move through that. So it says, bitter hostility against himself. Reckon up and consider it all in comparison with your trials. So we take what Jesus endured and we put it in comparison to our trials. And that is one of the ways that God is showing us that we are able to get our minds right, to, to uh, get a handle on our situation, to get back up and run our race so that you may not grow weary or exhausted. Do you know, if I sit and think about things that are negative, it is absolutely exhausting. I'll just, I'll have to like sit there and think, my goodness, why do I feel so tired tonight? What's going on? And I, it doesn't take me long to look back and go, well, how did you spend your afternoon? What were you talking about? What were you dealing with? What were you thinking about? It is absolutely exhausting to think about our trials. Do you know there is a minister in Minneapolis that had um, like a brain surgeon as uh, a guest at their church? And it was so interesting. This brain surgeon said that the studies have shown that if there is a traumatic situation in our life, or if uh, something has gone wrong, something negative in our life, our body does not know the difference between when it actually happens and when we are recounting it in our minds. 
So what does that mean? That means if I meditate on things that are negative, and the Word tells us to meditate on things that are lovely and of good report, right? So right there, God's already told us, these are the things that I want you to meditate on. Lovely, good report. But when we get in those times where we are thinking through, oh my goodness, I can't believe that that person did that to me. Or for me, it might be thinking through the grief that I went through when my husband passed away. If I stay there, my body and my mind does not know that I'm not going through it again. Okay? That was eye-opening for me. So that means that if I'm meditating on things that are negative, my body, I'm putting my body through things as if it was happening to me all over again. That helped change my life. That helped me when I have those thoughts and I'm stewing about something. It's like, oh my goodness, I need to let that go. Because unforgiveness is not healthy. Bitterness is not healthy. And if we in our minds continue to think on those things, it has a similar effect to when it happened to us the first time. Wow. And it lines up right here with the word. He's telling us how to overcome that. He's saying, compare it, compare that trial to what Jesus endured, that you may not grow weary or exhausted, losing heart and fainting in your mind. So much of how we live starts in our mind, doesn't it? You know, Andrew says this a lot. He says that people don't just one day wake up and go do crazy things. They've been meditating on it. So let's take that and turn it to the Word of God. And actually, Andrew's got a new book that's coming out in about a year that is on imagination. Let's take God-given imagination and let's use it for good. Let's meditate on things that are positive. Let's see ourselves in a way that the Word of God shows us. When we take that and we meditate on the things that are good and lovely, it ministers and brings life to us. Do you know one of the books that um, really gives us very, very practical advice on how to live our life is Proverbs. It is full, of course, of wisdom. Proverbs is the book of wisdom. So when we go through Proverbs and we receive in there what God calls good and what God calls evil, and we choose to believe that and humble ourselves to that, that brings life. And um, Proverbs 3, 31 through 35 I just chose a few verses in there to help you with what are the things that I should be meditating on? What are the things that God has out there for me that he loves me so much that he wanted to make sure that I understand what brings life and the things to avoid? So in verse 31, he says, do not envy the oppressor and choose none of his ways. Okay, wisdom. All right, I can take that, Lord. You just help me to live that way, right? So do not envy the oppressor. Choose none of his ways. He goes on to say, For the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the upright. Okay, so he compares good and evil. This is a practical way to apply choosing life instead of choosing death. So if you just read, like uh, Carly Terdez was telling me, she reads a proverb a day. That is awesome. You meditate on the things that God shows you is choosing life, and you let go of the things and avoid the things that would be choosing death. So our time is already up. My goodness, I really am uh, excited about finishing up this series tomorrow. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. We will pick this up tomorrow and continue in the series Only Believe. God bless you. 
Thank you for joining me for our series, Only Believe. I pray that it has been a blessing and an encouragement for you. If you would like to order the product Only Believe in CD or DVD, go to my website, karenconrad.net, and click on Products, and it'll be available there for you. Also, if you would like to subscribe to my email list, go ahead and do that on my website and you'll receive updates and information that will encourage you in your walk with God. And finally, if you would like to partner with this ministry, it would be a huge blessing for me. So go to karenconrad.net and you can give financially to support this ministry. Thank you again and God bless you. You know, I've got great news for those of you who've been wanting to partake of Karis, but you just can't move. You can't seem to uh, find how to fit it into your schedule. We now have what we call e on this little iPad, and you get all of the first-year courses here. There's a total of 39 courses, eight hours teaching per course, so that... I think it's 312 hours worth of teaching. It's loaded on here so that you don't have to have an internet connection. It comes with headphones, wireless headphones, and this way you can take advantage of the first year of CARES curriculum, whatever your situation is. And you can interact with our staff. You take tests. They know where you are in this process. It's just a great way to take advantage of it. Check it out, eCARES. It's God that gives you power to get wealth. Find out how on the next Good News program. Greg Fritz Ministries wants to minister to you through prayer. Call our helpline at 918-749-7744, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Time. You can also order product and speak to someone about becoming a partner with Greg Fritz Ministries. We look forward to hearing from you today. The program you're about to watch is part of a free MP3 series we're making available to you as a gift from Greg Fritz Ministries entitled Carefree Living. Visit gregfritz.org to download the MP3s for free by entering code CARE72 at checkout. Are you tired of hearing nothing but bad news? Tune into the good news of the gospel. Welcome to Good News with Greg Fritz. Hello, I'm Greg Fritz. Welcome to the Good News Program. We are continuing our series on carefree living, and it has been just a joy to go through these truths again and revisit some of these things that have blessed me over the years. I have really had to trust, depend on God for the last 30 years as I've traveled around the world in ministry, and I've seen God come through time and time again. And there comes a point in your life where you just have to say, you know what, God is going to take care of me. In fact, you need to come to that conclusion that it's not if you're going to make it. You have settled that issue. You are going to make it. It's just you may not know how you're going to do it or how God's going to do it. But we need to be secure enough in His goodness in his faithfulness and in his word to settle the issue of our security, our provision, our our lives, that God is going to take care of us. That is so important because it shuts the door on worry. We were reading in Matthew 6, and <clears throat> I want to read through some of this again because Jesus is dealing with each uh, individual's uh, and the subject of worry from his perspective and really from God's perspective he, he honestly can't seem to understand why we worry in other words if he were an alien which he's not he's a human but he's like these humans are funny I don't get this worry thing how how do they how do they worry why do you worry it's like it never crossed his mind to worry about his provision, to worry whether his heavenly father would take care of him or not. And when we do, he can't, it's just like it doesn't make any sense. Why do you people worry? And and that's exactly what he said in Matthew 6, 28. 
Why do you worry about clothing? Jesus just just truly seemed puzzled by by our our habit of worry. He said, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. He goes on to talk about um, the birds of the air. And then in verse 32, he said this, for after all these things, the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly father knows you have need of all these things. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So I just think it's it's important for us to to, to every once in a while sit down and, and, and examine our lives. Are you spending time worrying? Are you concerned about things that, that are in the future that haven't happened yet? We need to make sure that we're building our life and our thoughts on the word word of God. There's assurance there. There's security there. There's assurance there. We should be able to lay down at night and sleep and rest knowing that our heavenly father knows that we have need of all these things. It's really an insult for him to say, after all these things, the Gentiles seek. He's saying you're acting like people that don't believe in God. You're acting like people that don't have a heavenly father why would you act that way you have a heavenly father and he is going to take care of you and so i related this this story but when i was young and i was about to move from my home to to go to college the first year of bible college and i was moving out of my dad's house my mom and dad raised me and took care of me i was telling the lord you you know my dad taking care of me all these years and now I'm going out on my own and I don't know if I can make it and I was just I was always real open with the Lord I was telling him my concerns and he just stopped me in my spirit and said no your dad has not been supporting you for 18 years I have I just used your dad to do it and he's trying to let me know that it's God himself that is taking care of me. He said, I used your dad to take care of you for 18 years. I'll take care of you for the next 18, but I may use a different method. And boy, that was several years ago. I'm not going to tell you how many, but there have been so many different channels that God has used over these years to provide for my needs, my family's needs, my ministry's needs. It has been incredible. What an incredible journey. I have learned this about God. You know, have you ever seen a, uh, I'll tell you the most dangerous thing in the living room is a man with a remote, remote control. And, and you can't, nobody can sit and watch television if there's a man in his, in his, his easy chair with a remote, because he's always changing channels. Have you ever seen that? Zip, about the time you get zip, zip, zip. God loves to change channels. And about the time you find some channel of supply that you feel comfortable with, don't be surprised if he changes the channel. Don't be surprised if God uses new and unknown methods to meet your needs. The point is this. God shouldn't have to personally hand you your paycheck every Friday for you to understand that he's behind it. If it weren't for God, you wouldn't have the ability to get a job, to trade a skill, or to trade some sort of good or goods or services for money. God set that up for your benefit. He has allowed you to earn a living. And that's much better than sitting on the sideline and having God come by every week and say, here, here's your allowance. Go go buy some food. He didn't want us to live that way. God wants us to, to, to grow and live and thrive and overcome and, and progress and prosper. God is excited about our growth and our progression as, as his children. He's for us, but he's behind us. He's there to take care of us. And so Jesus was saying, why do you worry 
I don't get this worry thing. It's like a foreign language to him. It's like a foreign thought. It never entered his mind. Deuteronomy 8.18, this is something that goes along with what God told me when I was 18 years old. Deuteronomy 8.18, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. So you may be getting wealth, get, be getting paid, and you may be working to earn your pay, but it's God that's given you the power to do that. Without God, you wouldn't have a structure, a system, whereby you can work and, and, and get paid. All of this is due to God. I mean, we, we put so much trust in ourselves and so much pressure on ourselves, but folks, you wouldn't even be alive if it weren't for God. You wouldn't know up from down, right from left. You wouldn't know what to do to survive one day if it weren't for God Almighty. And so he's just Jesus is trying to tell us that you have a heavenly Father. Don't think that you're in this by yourself because you're not. Now, I want to make some points about your Heavenly Father that, that will hopefully help you to say goodbye to worry and fear and anxiety when it comes to your personal well-being. Number one, God, He knows you. He knows about you. And I, don't, I think some people go to God in prayer as if they're letting God know their problem and He's finally finding out about it for the first time. He's not. He knows. In fact, Jesus said this, Matthew 6, 32, For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. He knows that you need these things. He knows what you need even before you do. One of the greatest examples of this is that God knew we would need a Savior when he made put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God knew we would need a Savior before Adam ever sinned. So how do you know that? Because Jesus is called the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That just simply means that God knows the answer before you even know the problem. Before the problem exists, God has an answer. You, you, you have to realize who you're dealing with here. If you could see your life from heaven's perspective, you would see an all-sufficient, almighty, all-knowing God with all power, with his entire attention focused on you. He knows everything there is to know about you. He knows more about you than you know about yourself. And, and because of his great love, he has determined that he's going to meet our needs. Well, God does what he says he'll do. So your life is not lived by chance. You're not here by yourself. We're not waiting to see what happens to see if you make it or not. God has you in his sights. He cares about you. Number one, he knows. Another scripture that reveals this this truth, which I love this scripture, and I've quoted it before in this teaching, but we're going to go back to it. Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 and 30 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? Not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. And so what he's saying is God knows all about the birds. He knows every bird. Not one bird does one thing without God knowing. God knows everything. I know that's hard to comprehend because we're humans and our knowledge is limited and we only know so much about so many things. Some of you can't even remember to name your kids half the time. You call, call them by the wrong name. I understand when you do that, you start thinking, I'm not sure how much God knows either. Well, God knows everything about everybody. He is all-knowing. And so it, it went on to say, he, the very hairs of your head are numbered. And I, to me, that, that gives us some insight into his, his specific unlimited knowledge, his unlimited ability to hold information. Talk about computer. 
computers. God knows everything about you, including how many hairs are on your head, which that number changes by the day, by the by the hour, by the shower. Every every day that number is changing, that the number of hairs on your head. And 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 I like to ask this question. Do you know how many hairs are on your head? I mean, it's your hair, it's your head. Don't you care about it? Don't Doesn't it mean anything to you? Do you know how many hairs are on your head? If you had to go count the hairs on your head, could you tell me how many hairs you have on your head? You couldn't even count them. And if you did, by the time you got done counting them, it would have changed. What this simply means is this. God knows more about you than you know about yourself. He knows your needs. He knows the needs before you know them. And he knows the answer. You are dealing with God here. And God has said he's going to take care of you. And Jesus understands these things about God. And that's why in Jesus thinking, why are you worried? Do you not know that all of heaven's attention is focused on you? Do you not know that all of heaven's resources are made available to you? Don't you know your heavenly father who takes care of the birds, who who takes care of all the plants and animals in the world? Don't you know he's going to take care of you? We need to stop worrying about these little these earthly things and trust our heavenly father. He knows. You may think that you're, uh, you have an emergency or a crisis or an, an unexpected expense, and it may be unexpected to you, but it's not to God. He knows these things. He knows how to get through them. He knows what to do to help you get through it, to supply for you in your time of need, in the time of your greatest needs. God's there to take care of you. Trust him. Lean on him. Stop worrying and trust God. Trade worry for for faith. And, and we're going to tell you how. I'll give you a, a preview to that. That's Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to who? God, your heavenly Father, who knows what you have need of before you ask, who knows how many hairs are on your head. You take your care to Him. Take your emergency needs to Him. Take your crises to Him. Take, take your, your trials and tribulations, your problems, your questions. Take them to Him because He cares for you. All right, so He knows. So the, the, there's three points that I want to make here and that is first he knows now there are people that believe that god knows they believe that god's all powerful and that he knows but they don't think he's going to do anything for them somehow these people feel like god has got all this power and ability he's just not that interested in me little old me or or i've been so bad he's just kind of left me to myself God will never leave you nor forsake you. God hasn't changed his opinion about you. God hasn't changed his mind about you. God hasn't changed his promises to you. God means and and still means everything he ever said about taking care of you and protecting you and <laughs> providing for you and being a very present help in a in time of trouble. And I don't care what you feel of yourself. Don't project your self-hatred, your self-loathing. Don't project that to God. God doesn't feel that way about you. He still loves you. He still has you in his heart. He still has your best interest in mind. And he still has ways to meet your needs and to get you through every trial and every crisis. Isn't that great to know? So he cares. He cares. By, by showing us that in Matthew 6 that God or Matthew 10 that God is concerned about birds and God is and God knows the hairs on your head what he's saying is you mean so much to God he cares so deeply about you in fact in in the message bible let me read it in Matthew 10 29 30 what is the price of a pet canary some loose change right and God cares what happens to it even more than you do. He pays even greater attention to you 
down to the last detail, even numbering on your head. Do not fear, therefore, for you of you are of more value than many than a million canaries. You, you are worth more than a million canaries. So so God is 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 saying if he cares about birds, how much more does he care about you? Can I just tell you you're not the human animal. You have not evolved from animals to this higher form of life. We were created by God because he wanted children. You were created the motive for your existence was love. And that has not changed. God still loves you. God cares about you. He knows your needs. And he's moved with compassion towards you. And you, we all need to be reminded of that. Because we can turn faith into some um, impersonal principle or key that has no personal application and it's just not helpful but when you see that God loves you and he cares about you as a person then it makes it more personal and it helps you to understand that God is going to take care of you this isn't a you don't get taken care of because you do more good than bad or because you score high enough on your activity charts God has chosen to take care of you because he loves you. He cares. You're worth more than a million canaries. So God not only knows, but he cares. And then number three, he provides. He, God provides. He doesn't just sit there knowing and caring. He does something. You know, if he did that, if God knew and cared and didn't move in your behalf, then he would be doing what what he what he told uh, us not to do in James. He said, "Faith without works is dead." And if you say you love somebody but you don't help them in their time of need, you don't love them. Faith without works is dead. Well, God is the example of faith with the works. Now he won't move in your life until you let him, unless you allow him, unless you believe him, unless you invite him. He's not going to push himself on you. He's not going to force his will in your life. But if you will accept his offer of provision, if you will believe in his goodness and mercy and his promises toward you for your supply, God will follow up his knowing and his caring with providing. He will put action to his love, to his concern for you. That's just how God works. In Matthew 6, 28, 29, Jesus said, why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They, do, they toil not nor spin. Yet Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now look what it goes on to say in verse 30. If God so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And this isn't just a, an issue of clothing. You understand Jesus is using food and clothing because everybody needs that. Those are basic needs. But in this modern time, our basic needs have changed. You need food and clothing. You need a place to live. You need to be able to pay your utilities and your rent or your mortgage. You need to be able to make a car payment or pay for a car and pay for fuel. There, there are basic needs that we have as humans to operate in this world. In other words, he's not saying, I'm going to clothe you and feed you, but the rest of it, you're on your own. You, you're going to have to walk. If you just, just walk wherever you got to go and you're on your own, live in a cave. No, God understands our basic needs as humans. He didn't say, I'll make you a billionaire and make you filthy rich. He said, I'm going to take care of you. You are not going to have to worry about your basic needs in society. I'm going to make sure that you're... If we could just relax and let that mean what it means and let God's word be, you know, have more authority in our lives than anything else, we could be so much happier. God is going to take care of you. How much time have we spent worrying about our needs and worrying about getting our needs met? 
I, I was writing an article and I wrote this in it. You know, when we worry or worry is meditating on a situation that may or may not have happened. And when you worry about a problem, when you worry and you anxious over a problem, you're doubling and tripling the load on your life. Not only do you have to solve the problem, not only do you have to work out the situation, but now you have to carry the worry. So that makes it even more difficult. God's saying, you know what? Give that load to me. Roll that care over on me. Don't carry that burden of concern and wondering and, and hoping and thinking and meditating in the negative sense. Many of the things that people worry about haven't even happened and won't happen. Proverbs 28, 1 says, The wicked flee when no one pursues. Well, I don't want to spend my life running from things that aren't there or being afraid of things that haven't happened or won't happen. It's just not necessary. We ought to have enough, as much faith as a bird and trust that, you know what, when winter comes, I'm going to have food and shelter. When summer comes, I'll have a place to build a nest and have a family. I'm going to trust God as least as much as a bird or grass in the field which bears beautiful flowers and they're gone tomorrow. You know, that all happens every year. No stress, no worry, no concern. It just goes on. It's the rhythm of life. And God put you here. We're the only part of God's creation that could wring our hands and wonder if God's going to come through again. That's like worrying if the, if the sun's going to come up in the east tomorrow. It's going to. God said it. God put this in motion. And as long as, as the world is here, there's going to be day and night. You can count on it. And one of those other absolutes is that God is going to take care of you. He says, he says after all these things the Gentiles seek, we shouldn't act like people without a God. We're not here by ourselves. We have a Heavenly Father who cares about us. Don't live like someone who doesn't know God. And finally, he says in verse 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Don't you love that? Really, what he's saying is, you're, you're spending your time worrying about these natural things while there are kingdom things that you could be thinking about and practicing and enjoying and making progress in. And your whole life is consumed by worrying about these things that are already taken care of. He said, if you'll just let that go and seek first the kingdom, the things of God, read your Bible, spend time in the word, go to church, get, get into the things. To go, be a blessing to people, help people, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things will be added to you. I dare you to try that. Trade all of your care and concern for kingdom thinking, kingdom living, kingdom talking, and see if these things don't get taken care of in the process. And that's what he's saying. All of the time we spend worrying is wasted time. You don't have to do it. You can say no to worry. Worry is a choice you don't have to make. Make the decision today to rejoice in Him, enjoy Him, take a deep breath, and just enjoy life. Be a blessing to those around you because you're glad, because you're happy, you're well adjusted. Amen. Well, I hope you got something out of that. We're actually coming to the conclusion of this series. So if you'd like to get your free download, you can get it today. It's called Carefree Living. Go to my website to the product page. This is a pay, a pay for product, uh, but you can download it for free at checkout at the download. Uh, enter the code CARE72, C-A-R-E-7-2, and then it'll, the, the, it will be $16 without the code. But you enter the code and you can get this download free of charge as my gift to you. Thank you for being with me today. I look forward to our next time together. And until then, may God's best be yours. In this new series, you'll learn from the scriptures why worry is not an option and how to replace fear with faith in the midst of any trial. Visit gregfritz.org to download the MP3s for free by entering CodeCare72 at checkout.
Greg Fritz Ministries wants to minister to you through prayer. Call our helpline at 918-749-7744, Monday through Friday, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Time. We look forward to hearing from you today. If you're enjoying this teaching on carefree living, you can get all the notes. You may be a note taker and you haven't had time or haven't been in a position to take notes during the teaching. If so, I've taken the notes for you. It's all here, all these pages. It's all ready for your consumption. Go to my website to the study notes tab on the home page and download your free copy of Carefree Living Study Notes today. Greg Fritz Ministries is reaching new people daily with the Word of God online and at conferences. I have never heard of Greg Fritz. I actually never heard of Greg, Greg Fritz before this conference, but he's really funny and I love listening to him. That's what happens in services like this. Oh, you can't see it, but in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit will make sure that we do. We'll be talking about this and talking about that and seeds are going out all over the congregation. And you may have come and said, I need you to do something for me God I've got to have my miracle well listen because it's those who hear that receive it's those who hear the Bible says be careful how you listen for to those who hear more will be given isn't that an ingenious plan if you have been encouraged by Greg Fritz Ministries please partner with us to reach more people with the good news of Jesus bring Karis with you wherever you go with our new Karis app Free to download the Karis app allows you to easily access everything Karis Bible College has to offer in one place. Receive exclusive grace content and explore unique Karis features. Watch or listen to archived resources and teachings. Follow along with the Bible reading plan or listen to the audio Bible. The Karis app brings everything in one place. Download your app today. I'd like to encourage you to call in. And I know that God is speaking to many, many people. And you may have had the Lord touch you today. And if you just need somebody to touch and agree with you, the scripture says, if any two of you agree touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father. So we have these people, I mean powerful people who love God and are equipped in the Word of God. They're there to pray with you and help you. The number is 719-635-1111. That's 719-635-1111. Hello, I'm Kenneth Copeland. Every believer has a voice, and it's the voice of victory. My God. Now, we're, uh, we're, we're going to be going to the book of James. Anyway, let's, let's just go there now. That's a golden text for this time. But, and the book of James is a faith book. It is a faith book. And it's all about the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect way work that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. This is Jesus' half-brother that wrote this, pastor of that enormous church in Jerusalem, second only to the classic teaching that Jesus did about it, in the 11th chapter of the book of Mark. Praise God. But I want you to see something here. From James chapter 4, the 17th verse. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and does it not, to him it is a sin. You know to vote. You know it's the thing you should do. Yeah, but I don't like either one of them. That is no excuse. That is no excuse. Well, I don't like either one of them, so I'm not going to vote. You just voted for the wrong one when you did that. 
When you did that, you voted against God's pick. You, you pray and seek God with all your heart. For whom am I to vote? You don't just do it because your kinfolks did. Either party, I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm telling you to pray and get it in your heart and you're satisfied you have spent the time with God fasting and praying if you need to. To find out for whom you are to cast your ballot, which is your seed. And you know to do it and you don't do it. It's a sin in the eyes of God. And there's a lot more here at stake than the economy. The economy is, is, is very, very important, but it's not the most important thing. I heard the Lord say this. It was so strong, it was almost audible. It was, it was in that, that area of prophetic voice, which just, oh, you just hear it with your whole being. I heard him say this. Anybody, anybody that votes knowing, knowing it's an announced fact that they are all for and push abortion, push it. He said, I will hold that person. They know that and cast that vote in there anyway. I will hold them responsible just the same as I hold that doctor responsible for committing murder. This is serious business, serious business. And like I said, your ballot is your seed. Determine in your heart how the Lord wants you to vote. Take time and listen to him. Listen to him. Now, the third chapter of the book of James. Now, like I said, this, this is a faith book. It's talking about how faith works and what causes it not to work. Very simple book. This is the book in chapter 2, verse 23, or chapter 1, verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, someone that just hears it and won't act on it, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass for he beholds himself and goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he is or what he saw in the mirror. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. This is the man that preached about corresponding action to the word. So let's go on over into the third chapter. Verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation. That word actually in the Greek is manner of life. And it's translated conversation in, in the, the King James Version of the Bible, which you know is, is very, very old, ancient use of these words. So, show a... Out of a good or his life of faith, his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Just be quiet. Just, just don't say it. Just don't say anything. 
This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly. It is of the five physical, senseless, and it's devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above, or in other words, the word of God in Luke, uh, Luke 49, 11, 49, Jesus called the written word the wisdom of God. But the wisdom, the word of God that's from above is first pure. And it's peaceable. And it's gentle. And it's easy to be entreated. Full of mercy and good fruits. Without partiality, it'll work for anybody, anytime, anywhere they'll put it to work. You can just be right, just, just, just about to just dress somebody down and just catch yourself. And say, no, 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 I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it. No, 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 no. I repent. I repent. Forgive me. It's gone. Without hypocrisy. Ah, oh, now Copeland, come on. You... Name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, bunch. Well, I named it, claimed it, blabbed it, grabbed it, and I got it. <laughs> well, you hypocrites. You're just going around saying you're healed all the time. Anybody can see you, you're sick. You got all the symptoms of the flu. You got everything. To, and you go around saying, I'm healed. But you hypocrites, you're not healed. You're just saying that trying to get somebody to give into your ministry. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. I didn't say I was healed because I look healed. I didn't say I was healed because I feel healed. You're right. I've done it before. Glory to God. Just be so sick I could hardly stand up and just stand before God. And I, I want to thank you that 2,000 years ago, you bought and paid for my sickness and disease and glory be to God. I, by his stripes, I was healed and I'm healed now and I'll stand and I'll say heal glory to God. I will not compromise by the word of faith. I will not compromise it. I won't compromise it. I'm not going to bed sick. Not as long as that book says by his stripes, you were healed, Kenneth. No, sir. No, sir. See what I mean? Now, something right here. Well, look here, Brother Copeland. I'm not healed. Can't you see that? Well, yeah. That, that, that's not the truth. That's a fact. It is the truth. I've got this on my... No, 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 no. No, wait a minute. That's not truth. That's fact. The truth is himself took our sicknesses and carried our diseases. He took our infirmities and carried our diseases, sicknesses. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. That's truth. And you take that truth, glory to God, and you hang on to that truth, and you don't let go of it, and you just keep on, and you just stay there, and you just pr praise God, and you don't ever quit. I guarantee you that truth will get rid of that fact. That's a good place to shout amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Absolutely so. Now then, we talked about that, about the staff of Jesus and so forth, and they were arguing and couldn't cast devils out and so forth. We dealt with that last night. And they said, why couldn't we cast him out? Jesus said, because of your unbelief. This time cometh out not but by prayer and fasting. Devils don't respond to fasting. Fasting won't, won't remove a devil. God never changes. You can't change God with fasting. No. Fasting ministers to you. Amen. Had they been spending more time 
fasting and praying and, and, and spending that time uh, listening, paying more attention to what Jesus said, had they, they would not have had time to argue with one another about who's going to get the big job when, he, when, when this is over with and he kicks out Rome. And... Hallelujah. Now let's go into this a little bit deeper. Strive, discord, lack of agreement or lack of harmony. It emphasizes a struggle for superiority. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. A wrathful man stirs up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeases strive. Now listen to this one. A forward disobedient or a troublemaker sows strife and a whisperer separates the best of friends. The beginning of strife is when one let is, is as one that lets out water like a little crack in the dam. Therefore, leave off contention before it becomes a fight. He who loves strive, loves transgression or sin, one translation says. One translation says that he who loves strife loves to sin. Just love to argue and just fight and fuss. Where no wood is, there is the fire goes out. So where there's no tail bearer, the strife ceases. Just let it stop with you. Just don't listen to that stuff anymore. Well, then did you hear what? Did you hear what? I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear that. Just don't come tell that to me. <laughs> Many years ago, James Robinson, glory to God. Oh my, James and I have been very, very close friends for over 30 years. And he came from the evangelical group. And of course, I, I came from the charismatic Pentecostal side. And uh, we were not supposed to like one another. <laughs> but we love one another. And this was, this was years ago. And there, he was in a minister's group and, and this man came up to James and just, just really started hammering me. I'd, and James said, uh, could I have everybody's attention, please? Could I have everybody's attention? Uh, this brother here has Brother Copeland on his heart. And uh, so he's going to lead us in prayer for brother. Go ahead, brother. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> See what he did? He stopped it right there with an act of love. I mean, he and Betty are uh, what lovely. I, I've never met. I, I've never met a a man in my life that exhibited that kind of precious love for the body of Christ. I've seen him just, just, just weep just because Christians are fussing with one another. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Father. Praise you for it, Lord. An angry man stirs up strife. A furious man abounds in transgression. Now I want to turn to this one in 1 Corinthians. Uh, let's just turn to this one. Those, those were from the book of Proverbs. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians. The third chapter. A 
Let's read those first three verses there. I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babies in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hither meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. You couldn't hear it. Neither yet now are you able. For you are yet carnal. For where is there is among you envying, strife, and divisions? Are you not carnal and walk as mere men, natural men? You're, you're, you're acting like natural unsaved men. You act like somebody's not even born again. You're just fussing and fighting all the time. There's that strife, division, dividing, division, the spirit of division is the author of one of the most despicable things in the eyes of God that exists, racism. I hate it. God hates it. It's the product of deep sin and judging people. People react and respond according to the way they were raised from little children. Amen. Therefore, different races of people have different mindsets and see things through their eyes. There's the black race. There's the white or Caucasian race. There is the red man of which I am a part. And the, then there, there's the Asian races, of course, and all of us in a different environment. Everybody sees a difference. And where there is a difference, Satan magnifies it in hate and brings about all of the strife and the wars and rumors of wars that he can possibly cause to take place. But it's up to us, the children of God, to put a stop to it. And to put a stop to it, we have to stop it in our own church congregations. We have to put a stop to fighting one another over politics. No, I, I didn't say we should do it. We have to do it. And we have to do it now. You walk as mere unchanged men. For one said, I'm of Paul. Another, I'm of, of Apollos. Are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I planted, Apollos watered, but it's God that gave the increase. Glory to God. There you have it right there. It's God. It's God. It's God that gives the increase. It's God that pulls our, our different nationalities together. It's God that brings in. It's God that brings the peace. 
that passes all understanding. If we are willing and strong to be obedient to his word. The Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast study notes will help you dive deeper into these powerful word-based teachings. Get all five days of notes at one time. Use them during the week for your personal study time. Download them free at kcm.org slash notes. Create a special family devotional time to follow along with the notes as you watch the broadcast. Study the scriptures with your children and begin instilling God's word now. Use these notes to build your faith library and build up a heritage of faith. Strife. It's an unseen enemy that's out to divide and destroy. You can see its effects daily on the news, social media, across nations, and even in our churches. But Jesus has given you authority over strife to overcome it. Learn how in the Living Free from Strife package, two mini books by Kenneth Copeland, A House Not Divided, and How to Conquer Strife, along with his CD teaching, The Force of Forgiveness also available as digital downloads. Understand the importance of James 3.16. Where there is strife, there's every evil work. God has empowered you to be a peacemaker. Overcome strife with the power of praise and thanksgiving. See how faith and answered prayer are vitally linked to forgiveness. Make a stand against division in your home, church, and nation. Greater is the power of love in you through the Holy Spirit than any strife that is in the world. Discover how you can conquer strife in every area of your life and put it under your feet where it belongs. Request your free copy of Living Free from Strife Package from Kenneth Copeland Ministries at kcm.org slash TV special or when you call 800-600-7395. Offer good for 60 days. Outside the United States, shipping charges may apply. Contact your regional office for more information. You don't have to live day in and day out in strife and under pressure. You can put an end to that by simply receiving Jesus into your heart, making him the Lord of your life. That's the beginning of your freedom from strife. But it starts with praying this prayer. And if you've never made Jesus your Lord, just say this out loud after me. Just come to him and say, Father in heaven, I come to you in Jesus name. I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is my Lord. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. I repent of every sin, failure, mistake. Make me new. I receive your forgiveness. Take my life, Lord Jesus. Do something with it and fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I know it's a simple prayer. You're thinking, okay, well, now what? What's happened? Here's what's happened. You are born again. Your spirit is now alive unto God. And the Bible says that old things are passed away. All things have become new. Glory to God. Jesus got the victory over death, over all the curse. And you know what he did with that? He gave it to you. He gave you this position of victory over sin. And to help you understand more about who you are in Jesus, who he is in you, KCM has a free salvation package. It includes a book called He Did It All For You by Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. And along with this book, we're going to send you two little brochures that are just there to help you learn how to read, how to study your Bible. We want you to get a hold of these things. We want you to find out who you are in Christ Jesus and who he is in you. So get it on KCM's website. That's kcm.org. You can request your free salvation package. And if God has done something good in your life, you need to let us know about it. We want to hear your story. We want you to testify of what, of what good our good God has done for you because we want to rejoice with you. When you share your testimony with somebody else, it's not just about what God's done for you, but God uses that to stir faith in the heart of other people who are believing for good things to see in their life too. So you become 
a preacher when you testify of the good things that God has done in your life. So call us, let us know. And especially if you made Jesus your Lord today, the Bible tells us that all of heaven rejoices when one comes home and everybody here at KCM gets excited about it too. So call us, write us, let us know. We want to rejoice with you. Thanks so much for watching today, everybody. We invite you to tune in again next time and hear a good word from God that will change your life forever. Until then, remember this, God loves you and we love you. And Jesus is Lord. God has a good plan for your life. If you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, Kenneth and Gloria Copeland have a gift for you. Request your free salvation package at kcm.org salvation. Take the next steps to help you begin your journey understanding who you are in Christ and how to live your new life in victory. As you continue to grow in your faith, believe God for new visions, His manifested power, and great change in your life. Wherever you are in the world, it's easier than ever before to connect with Kenneth Copeland Ministries and enjoy all of our online media including content exclusive to our website. Visit us at kcm.org and gain access to over 50 years of Bible teaching from Kenneth and Gloria Copeland right at your fingertips. Watch live streaming video of the Believer's Voice of Victory Sunday and daily broadcasts. Enjoy live programs from the Victory Channel and experience special events on demand. Browse through hours of archived audio and video teaching and immerse yourself in the Word through the online devotional From Faith to Faith. Download the latest BVOV magazine, including our enhanced interactive version. This free monthly publication is filled with powerful tools for spiritual growth, articles by ministry leaders, testimonies from partners, and much more. Watch the broadcast, read the magazine, designed, listen to me, to be a study center. Truth and Liberty Coalition is about what God's doing in the nations. This is a global movement, and what's happening in America is important because if America can get through this chapter, it's going to have ramifications for the reformation of nations all over the world. This is, the, this is a coalition for everyone watching, not just for America. Beyond the Game with Tony and JB. Stories that need to be told. To the outside world, it looked like there was nothing happening. I, that wasn't true. It's things like that that happen all the time that the public doesn't know about. Your body has an expiration date. I'm in bed the day after my surgery. Brian says, Anthony, when is enough enough? Beyond the Game with Tony and JB. Stories you won't hear anywhere else. Viewer supported Gospel Truth TV is free to listeners and free of charge for your favorite teachers. This is what we're hearing from people just like you receiving these messages of God's unconditional love and grace. Your teachings are transforming my life. Thank you. When you give to Gospel Truth TV, you're changing your life and touching countless others around the world. Click the Give button at the top or text GIVE to 719-301-2552. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. It's like he was just putting the pieces together for me in such a way that just was simple but powerful. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is God's truth right here. It wasn't always what I, what I wanted to hear, but I knew it was the truth, and I always wanted the truth. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I'm continuing to teach through this new book that I've got entitled More Grace, More Favor. I'll tell you, this is powerful. These are some of the most important foundational truths in the gospel. I've been using this verse out of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5 where it says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And the scripture also speaks of he gives more grace. So we all receive grace to a degree when you get born again, but you can receive more grace. Grace is not only unmerited favor, but it is everything that God has. But certainly it includes his favor, the blessing of God, 
And he gives more grace the more you humble yourself. And I've been, in a sense, redefining humility. Some people see humility as being low self-esteem, having a, a unworthy attitude and stuff. That's not true. You know, Moses over in, in Numbers chapter 12, he was criticized by his sister and brother, Miriam and Aaron, because he had an interracial marriage. He married an Ethiopian woman, which was a black woman. And of course, he was like that middle uh, Eastern complexion. So there was an interracial marriage. They criticized him over it. And Moses responded uh, to it. God struck Miriam with leprosy for criticizing Moses over this marriage. So that's quite a biblical statement about interracial marriage right there. But anyway, in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, it says, Now Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. That is an amazing statement. Moses is the person who saw the glory of God, his face shone. He spent so much time in the presence of God that his face literally radiated, reflected the glory of God. He spent 80 days with God without food or water, which is humanly impossible. He heard the audible voice of God. He saw the ten plagues. He saw the waters part, the Red Sea. This man was one of the greatest men used in the Old Testament, and it also said he was the meekest man on the face of the earth. There's a direct relationship between his humility and the grace, the power of God that was manifest in his life. I tell you, that is important. And yet today, most people have not really been raised in a godly system. These verses that I just read, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Most people don't humble themselves under the hand of the Lord. Our world system is into self-promotion, doing things on your own. And one of the things that I've been defining this week is that humility isn't just having this low opinion of yourself. Actually, that's not humility, that's pride. When God says that you are the righteousness of God, that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, but then you come back and say, oh, no, I can't do it. You know what that is? That's pride. You are exalting your opinion about yourself and what you can do above what God says about you. True humility isn't going above what God says about you, but it's also not going below what God says. If God says you can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, and you say, oh, I could never do that, you're in pride. You've exalted your opinion above God's opinion of you. I know that what I'm saying is just rattling some people. Like, I've never looked at it this way, but that's... That's what pride is. Pride is exalting your own opinion, your uh, abilities above God. And most people, see, don't really depend upon God. You can prove that by how much do they pray. Most people only pray when their back is against the wall, when they've reached the end of their limits, when they can't do something, then they cry out to God. But when everything's good, very few people really turn to the Lord. You know, that's one of the things that has really hurt our nation. This nation was founded upon godly principles by godly men. Contrary to what you may be hearing protesters say, our founding fathers were very godly men. God ordained this nation. And because we humbled ourselves and became dependent upon God, God has blessed this nation like no other nation on the planet. But in our prosperity, most people don't seek God. They wait until there's a crisis, and then all of a sudden they can find time to turn off the TV and to focus on God and to get serious with God. But when things are going good, most people depend upon themselves. They only depend upon God when it comes to something that's bigger than them, and that's the reason that they get into crisis. See, God's kingdom doesn't function the way that this world kingdom does. We should get to where we are dependent upon God for everything. As a matter of fact, if you'd look over in Exodus, Moses wanted to see the glory of God. He had already been in the presence of God. He had had the Ten Commandments given to him. He had already delivered the children of Israel out of bondage. He had already seen so many great things, but he just wanted to see the glory of God. And God's answer to him was, I will be with you and I will guide you. 
in my ways. And Moses, his response to that was, it was, I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically said, well, God, I was taking that for granted. If you don't go with us, I'm not moving. Now, see, that's a humble attitude. I'm not going to take a step. I'm not going to do anything until I hear from you. But most people, our world system, know it. you do everything on your own. And you only depend upon God when it's something beyond your own ability. I've already used this verse, but in uh, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, he says, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. That's the attitude that you ought to have, is it? Like Solomon, when the Lord gave him the choice of what do you want? I'll give you anything you want. And Solomon said, I'm like a child. I don't know how to go out and come in on my own. I need you to give me wisdom. You know what that is? That's a humble attitude. Those that consider themselves self-made men or women and I'm doing things my way and you only turn to the Lord when you get into trouble. That's the reason you get into trouble. It's because you did it your way. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. True humility is just being God dependent, recognizing that God, I'm like a child. I don't know how to come in or go out on my own. I need you to guide me, to direct me. I want to acknowledge you in all of my ways and have you direct my paths. See, that's a humble attitude. And that is contrary to the way that this world system operates. Let me read these verses to you out of Proverbs chapter 6. And in verse 16, it says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. That's the first thing he lists. A proud look. God hates pride. He doesn't hate the people that have pride. He died for you and he wants to move in your life. But God hates pride. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. Man, does that apply to us today? There's so many terrible things being done in our society, not the least of which is the murder of over 60 million unborn babies. And now they are even wanting to kill children that have been born and are outside of the womb and just let them die. God hates that. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Man, our society, there are people who are really committed to God and seeking God, but there's also an element of our society that I mean we let evil run unchecked, taking all limitations off, lawlessness, Feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Did you know we've got things going on in our world today, protest and things happen, and it's not just spontaneous. There are people that are planning this. Bricks don't just show up at where a protest is going to be that evening accidentally, pallets of bricks. It's planned. There are people that are sowing discord among the brethren. God hates it. God hates a proud look. You know, I've used this example uh, on the very first day, but let me just go back to some of the natural laws that we have. Electricity flows through copper much better than it flows through rubber or it flows through wood. You know, I'm a woodworker. I make all kinds of things out of wood, and I enjoy working with wood, and I just enjoy it. I'm not really into metal. I don't know how to do that. I don't have the equipment and stuff. And so if I was to build something, it would be easy for me to just use wood. But did you know that electricity won't flow through wood the same as it flows through copper? And just because I'm more familiar with wood, and wood is cheaper than copper, If I was to wire a house, let's say that I was building a house and I just wanted to wire it all with wood and hook the wood up to the electricity. Did you know the electricity won't flow through wood the same as it does through copper? Doesn't matter what I choose. There are laws that God established and electricity flows through copper much better than it flows through wood. So if I wire my house with nothing but wood, and then I flip the switch to turn on the lights and the lights don't come on, why would I get mad at the electric company for not 
you know, having things work when I didn't cooperate with the laws. See, in the natural, everybody understands exactly what I'm talking about. But then when it comes to spiritual things, there are people that are going completely contrary to this law that I've been talking about, that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And they operate in pride. It may not be arrogance in the sense that they think they're better than everybody else, but they operate independent of God. They do things their own way. And they only turn to God when they get into trouble. That's pride. And then when something doesn't work, all of a sudden they get mad at God. Like, God, why didn't you do something? I prayed. I asked for this. But God's power doesn't flow through a a person who is doing it their own way, following their own directions. I tell you, we create most of the problems that we have. Now, we live in a fallen world, and even if you were to do everything right, we got other people who will cooperate with the devil. And so you will have problems uh, that you will have to confront, even if you aren't the source of that problem directly. But most of the problems that we have... We are the ones that created it because we did things our own way. We create the mess and then we go to God and ask him to solve it. And if we don't see it happen, we get mad at him. That's just like a person who wires their house with wood instead of with copper wiring. And then when the lights don't work, when the electricity doesn't flow, you're angry at God. You can't understand why he didn't answer your prayers. There are laws that govern the kingdom of God, the same way there are physical laws that govern this natural world that he created. And I'm telling you that one of the ways that you see the power of God operate is through humility. That is a powerful statement. If you aren't operating in in humility, then you're operating under this curse of pride. Let me read some scriptures to you here. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 12. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. I'd imagine that every single person watching this program desires honor. You would like for people to respect you and honor you, and you would like to have people appreciate what you're doing and honor the contributions that you've made. But in God's kingdom, before honor is humility. It doesn't matter if you've done something, and even if it was good, if you did it for your own credit to get your own glory, it's not going to work. The Lord says, my glory I will not share with another. If you are self-promoting and seeking to get the acclaim of people for yourself, then you aren't operating in God's kingdom. Before honor is humility. You humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will lift you up. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Man, I, you know, there was a guy, I'm not going to call his name, but he was very well known, a minister and he fell. He fell big time. And I mean, he's just a fraction of what he used to be. And when he fell on on a Sunday morning, he came on his program and he admitted it and confront and he was trying to explain it. And anyway, in the process of him talking about what had happened, he was listing all of the things he had accomplished, that he had reached more people on television than any other minister of his day that he and he just listed all of these things. And he even said this. He says, I've. He says, I reach more people than Jesus ever reached. Man, what a statement. And in the process of describing all of this, he says, I thought I could do anything. And the moment he did that, this verse came to my mind. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And I said, that's the reason that this man who loves God And God has used him, and there's a lot of people that have been touched. This is the reason that he fell, because he got independent of God. He got to thinking, look what I have done. I have reached more people than Jesus ever reached. I guarantee you that attitude, the moment you see somebody operate like that, I can guarantee you a fall is coming. You have to remain humble before God. And this is one of the things, I don't know how many of you remember, but I've got a teaching out entitled Don't Limit God. 
and probably the second most important encounter I've ever had with the Lord as far as the ministry growing and, and accomplishing things. It happened on January the 31st, 2002. It to me from Psalm 78, 41. It says in their hearts they turned back and they limited the Holy One of Israel. And God spoke to me and said, you're limiting what I can do through you. And it was through pride. And one of the things that I was limiting was because I had experienced all of this stuff that we're talking about. I knew that people, more people have been destroyed by prosperity than they have ever been destroyed by hardship. Some people may disagree with that, but that is an actual statement. And I was thinking specifically about David, that David, as long as he was having to run for his out to kill and David just sought the Lord, and he operated in a powerful way of humility. But when he became king and he was so prosperous, it says Second uh, Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, that at the time when kings go forth to battle, David was the king. He should have been out fighting battles, but he was so prosperous, and this was a relatively small skirmish, that he just sent Joab out to do his business. And David was bored. He had reached his goals, and it says he got up off of his bed at eventide. In other words, when other people were going to sleep, he was just waking up. That means he had been sleeping during the day. He was bored, and he was operating independent, and that's when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. That's when he wound up killing her husband. And I've seen through that that more people are destroyed by prosperity. When everything is going good, people tend not to recognize their dependence upon God. And they get into pride and they get lifted up with pride and pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So one of the ways that I was limiting God, I was afraid of the ministry really growing and becoming large and touching lots of people because I, I was afraid that I'd get lifted up with pride. And you know what? God told me that that was actually pride. I knew God wanted me to have a large ministry and reach people all over the world, but I was afraid that it would affect things, and so I wasn't doing what God was leading. He was giving me opportunities that I wasn't taking because I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, resist the temptations of pride and some of these things. And finally, the Lord spoke to me and He says, "I've spent thirty something years. I think at that time it was um, thirty-four years." preparing you for this. And he says, you need to trust me. And I had to step out and trust God. And I'm telling you, since that time, it is phenomenal what God has done in my life and in my ministry. And it's, and it's because I had to humble myself. I had to quit thinking the way that this world thinks. And so people come for prayer and uh, they ask for all of these things, finances, healing or whatever. And yet many of them are operating in this world system of pride. They aren't dependent upon God. They're doing things their own way, but then they want the results that godly living produces. And I'm telling you, God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. When we become dependent upon God and humble ourselves before God, that's one of the best things that you can do. And and yet people like, say, for instance, when it comes to finances, the scripture says, oh, no man, anything. And yet the average Christian doesn't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. They just want something. They want it now. And people are willing to extend credit to you because on credit, you will pay two or three times what the actual price of that thing is. And so, man, they'll give you credit because they're going to make buku amount of money off of you. And it's so easy to get credit. And so Christians just ignore what God says. They overextend themselves and then something like a pandemic happens, then you don't have any reserves because you are just living uh, off of monthly payments and stuff and you are in debt up to your eyeballs and something happens and you can't make it. Then you come running to the Lord and, oh God, please, uh, you know, do something. They've ignored all of the instructions of the Lord, and but they want the benefits. See, that's not how the kingdom works. 
You have to humble yourself. And humbling here is just talking about you need to exalt God's opinion above your opinion. You need to exalt God's ways above what the world is saying. How does the world say? Well, the world says get all you can, can all you get, and then sit on your can. That's not what God's system says. God's system says don't owe people anything that you need to give, that when you give is when you get it back, you sow, you reap, and stuff. It's completely contrary to this world system, and yet people are constantly operating outside of God's system. Look at this. Did you know that Lucifer... His original sin was pride. Look at these verses here. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. Did you know Lucifer's sin wasn't hating God? It was envying God. He wanted the glory that was reserved for God alone. It was pride. It was self-exaltation. He tried to exalt himself, and because of it, he was cast down to hell. Did you know that the original transgression against God was pride? And then this same thing just passed right on down to Adam and Eve. Lucifer came to them and says, has God said, no, the reason he doesn't want you to eat of this fruit is because he doesn't want you to reach your full potential. He's holding you back. And did you know it was their self-promotion? They felt like they were missing out on something. They were missing out on a lot of sickness, disease, hatred, strife, jealousy, hurt, pain, on and on. They missed a lot by following God. But when they exalted their own wisdom and thought that I know more than God does and, and you know, God is trying to hold me back. You know what that was? That was pride. That was them promoting their own opinion, leaning under their own understanding. And that's the origin of all of our sin. Man, I've got a lot more to share about this, but I'm out of time today. We will continue it on our program tomorrow. Let me remind you that I've got a new book on this entitled More Grace more favor. And I've got not only the book, but CDs, DVDs. And then if you get any of these materials for a gift of any amount, you can also ask for this free gift of self-centeredness, the source of all grief. This is like the Cliff Notes version of this whole teaching. Listen to our announcer and please call or write today. Andrew's teaching, More Grace, More Favor, is available as a brand new book or as a CD or DVD album made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources are available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. Or you can get the More Grace, More Favor package, which includes the book and your choice of either the CD or DVD album. This package has a catalog value of $50, but you can receive all of these valuable resources today for just $35. Also today, Andrew has a bonus offer. You can request the Self-Centeredness, The Source of All Grief booklet for free when you order either the book, CD, or DVD album from Andrew's new teaching, More Grace, More Favor. The free booklet is limited to one free per household and is only available in the U.S., U.K., Canada, and Australia. Go to awmi.net to see all the ways you can get these teachings. If you haven't yet partnered with us, I'd like to encourage you to pray about it. And then if the Lord says so, join with us because we are taking the gospel not only through television, but we have 8,000 students going through Karis Bible College with over 8,000 graduates. We're pumping out over 200,000 free hours of material on our website. And we're just reaching all around the world. We couldn't do it without partners. So join with us and become a partner with us today. You can become a Grace Partner or order resources through our website at awmi.net. Or you can call our helpline 24 hours a day, 5 days a week, Monday through Friday at 719-635-1111. 
to write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. I'd like to give you a special invitation to join me on September the 24th through the 26th for our Identity in Christ Conference. I'm going to have Pastor Dwayne Sheriff with me. He's one of my great friends. He's on my board of directors. He is one of the most powerful ministers that I know. And both of us, it is this truth about who we are in Christ, a revelation of what I call spirit, soul, and body that has changed our lives. And we are just going to take both of our teachings, both of our revelations, what God has done in our life, and just pour it into you for these three days. Remember, it's September the 24th through the 26th at our Karis Bible College in Woodland Park, our Identity in Christ Conference. Have you checked out the Inside Story yet? It's a great way for you to get an inside look of what is happening at Andrew Womack Ministries. With years of interviews, there's a lot to get excited about. Check out this month's featured story today, only at awmi.net. I want to let you know that we have now started a Karis Daily Live Bible Study. We've been doing a Bible study every Tuesday night live for about two years, but now we have five days a week. We've varied the times so that we can accommodate anybody's schedule, and it's going to really be good. We're going to use our instructors from the school and it'll be a blessing. So remember, we now have a Karis Daily. Do you want to connect with like-minded believers? Then Karis Bible Studies is the place for you. Find a Bible study near you by visiting karisbiblestudies.net. I'd like to encourage all of you who claim to really have a relationship with the Lord to get out and vote in these upcoming elections. I'm amazed that there were over 25 million Christians registered to vote who did not vote in the last election cycle. I tell you, that's sin. That's wrong. We have not only the privilege, but a responsibility to vote. So I'd just like to encourage you to take your Christian responsibility to vote seriously. Get out and vote for righteousness this election. Bring Karis with you wherever you go with our new Karis app. Free to download the Karis app allows you to easily access everything Karis Bible College has to offer in one place. Receive exclusive grace content and explore unique Karis features. Watch or listen to archived resources and teachings. Follow along with the Bible reading plan or listen to the audio Bible. The Karis app brings everything in one place. Download your app today. I'd like to encourage you to call in. And I know that God is speaking to many, many people. And you may have had the Lord touch you today. And if you just need somebody to touch and agree with you, the Scripture says, if any two of you agree touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father. So we have these people, I mean powerful people, who love God and are equipped in the Word of God. They're there to pray with you and help you. The number is 719-635-1111. That's 719-635-1111. This program is brought to you by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries. Coming up next on Changing Your World. Are you still stuck in that old mindset? Are you still stuck in the way you used to think 10 years ago? And things are still the same because your thinking is still the same? Change the way you think, then you'll change the way you live. Grace Life 2020 featuring Creflo Dollar, Taffy Dollar, Michael Smith, Gregory Dickow, and Andrew Womack. Come see what God's got to tell you. It's eye open, it's heart open, it's just life changing experience. Don't miss it. We've been to every one of them. Don't miss it. Join us as we bring you Grace Life 2020. To register now, text Grace Life to 51555 or visit us at creflodollarministries.org.
Proverbs 20, verse 27. And um, we're going to talk about some things. We've been talking about God's commitment to lead and to guide us to our destiny. And God is committed. He, he prepares our steps. He's working on the inside of us. He's let us know that he knows the plans that he has for us, plans for good and not for disaster, plans for an expected end, and that God is the one that says, you know what, you can, you can try to, to uh, you know, to plan your life, but God's going to be responsible for the steps, and he will get you to where you need to be. There's nobody in the room to th this morning that um, you're just here for no reason at all. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And in the time that we're living in today, we need to understand what God's plan is for our life. We don't need to be wasting time going in a circle over and over and over again and continuously missing the purpose and the plan for our life. If you are alive today, there's a plan that God has for you. I said, if you're alive today, there's a plan that God has for you. And the plans that he knows the plans that he has for you. And they're good, praise God. And but uh, I believe one of the things we need to recognize as Christian people is that, you know, if we're going to benefit from God knowing the plans for our life, we're going to have to understand how important our relationship is with him. And the interest of his word brings life and spending time with God. God knows how to direct us. God knows how to lead us. God knows how to speak to us. And in this day and time, you need to have that kind of relationship where God is directing your life and God is leading you. It's not just wearing the title of Christian, but it's benefiting from a heavenly father that knows how to direct you that uh, knows how to speak to you and say to you, this is the way, walk therein. To know that you have a God that you can hear to say, turn left or turn right. And I think sometimes Christians have gotten so numb to the fact that they serve a God that can talk. And you are his sheep and you can hear from God. And he wants to direct your path and it's time for you to just simply acknowledge God knows how to direct me. God knows how to help me to get to where I'm supposed to be. It doesn't have to be hit or miss. Your relationship with God is designed so you can, you can hear this voice. You can begin to be sensitive to the directions that he will supply for your life. It is God's will for you to be led by him. He wants you to be led by him. He wants you to be led by him. And so what I want to do this morning, uh, I, I thought about referring to this as a, the prerequisites or, you know, things that are required beforehand. But when you deal with God <coughs> and you deal with this covenant of grace, you know, there are a lot of things God will do out of his grace that you're, you're, you don't even qualify for. So I, I, I more or less want to get you to the point of understanding that this is how you can position yourself and to open yourself up to be able to be led by God and to hear from God. I thought about this scripture where it talks about that he gives more grace to the humble. And just by recognizing that, you become sensitive to living a life of humility and, and you know, it opens up what God can do. So the question is, am I doing something that's making it difficult for me to receive the transmission? How many, how many of you remember when we had the big antennas on top of our roof? All right. How many of you remember the little, little ears on top of the, 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 the television? You remember the aluminum foil? You remember the little dial that used to turn to adjust it? We knew that a transmission for the broadcast was going out, but sometimes it was all about the positioning of the antenna. And sometimes I think we had people to come out and get on the roof to position. They would say, your antenna just needs to be adjusted. 
and they would come and position the antenna. This is what this is about today. I, I, I want to show you how to position the antenna. It's not that God is not speaking, more or less, you, your antenna, there's some things that you need to adjust so you can receive the transmission. It's not that he's not directing your life, we just need to, somebody need to get on the roof and adjust the antenna. Sometimes when, when, when Super Station 17 came out, and sometimes when we were up there with the, how many of you remember, hangar? You know you had to be real broke to go to the hangar and the aluminum foil. But sometimes you would get up there and adjust it, and while your hand was on it, it would come in clear. And we'd say, don't move. <laughs> and you'd just be stuck there in that position trying to look at the television as well. But I'm telling you, I believe that what I'm going to share with you today are just instructions of how to position yourself to receive the transmission. Number one, <laughs> I want to get right into this. Uh, well, let's, let's look at the text. I apologize. Let's, let me give you a text. Look at Proverbs 20 and verse 27. Uh, we're going we're gonna to look at how to position the antenna to be led by God. Amen. Uh, here's what the Bible says in verse 27. He says, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Now, remember, man is a spirit. He possesses a soul, and he lives in a physical body. You don't have a spirit. You are a spirit being. Uh, spirit and soul over the years have been used interchangeably as if they are the same. You are a spirit. You have a soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotion. Your soul is your thinker, your filler, and your chooser. You have, you, you, you have a soul. You are a spirit. Don't use those interchangeably. You have a soul. You are a spirit. Say, I am a spirit being. I, spirit being. I, possess, a I possess a soul. I live in the physical body. But the real you is a spirit being. You are not your soul. You are not your body. You are your spirit. You are a spirit being. When you die, then your spirit man, the real you, is separated from your body, the house that you live in. Glory be to God. Somebody says, well, I want you to know my grandmama. We lost my grandmama. No, your grandmama's not lost. If she's born again, to be absent from the body, watch this, is to be present with the Lord. So the real you is a spirit being. Say that out loud. The real me is a spirit being. I have a soul. I live in a physical body. Now, the day you get born again, that, that spirit, man, is, is brand new. It's made just like God. So the next step, now that you're born again, a third of you is all, one third of you is already perfect. So the next part is to renew your mind with the Word of God. To renew your mind is an exchanging of your ideas and your ways of thinking to line up with God's ideas and His ways of thinking. Your mind is, is kind of like the pilot seat for your life. And the most important thing you can do as a born-again Christian is to renew your mind. Why? So you can prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable, watch this, will of God. You want to know the will of God, the plan of God for your life? I tell you, you've got to understand the importance of renewing your mind. And renewing your mind is not a one-time, you know, event. It, it is a lifetime process. It's something that we do every day of our lives. And I'm, I want to make this clear because somehow or another we think that, you know, when I became a Christian and now that I'm saved, everything's just going to be right. No. When you became a Christian and you're born again, your spirit, man, was made new. But your mind still needs to be renewed. You need to, you need to renew your mind. You need to think differently. Think differently. As a man, what? Thinketh, then what? So is he. Are you still stuck in that old mindset? Are you still stuck in the way you used to think 10 years ago? And things are still the same because your thinking is still the same? Change the way you think, then you'll change the way you live. But if you maintain, even if you got born again, maintain that old mindset, then you're going to maintain that old life set. So here's what he said. The spirit of a man... Your born-again spirit is the candle of the Lord. Now, what does a candle do in the natural? 
you light that candle in the natural, it will begin to provide guidance in dark places. And he says, he's going to light your spirit. You're going to get born again. Your spirit, now the new creation, is the candle of the Lord. And notice, searching all the inward parts of the belly. God will guide you through your spirit. God will guide you through your spirit. And so there are certain positions that, that I believe that we've got to begin to get in in order to take full advantage of divine divine direction. Uh, God just, doesn't just lead, lead everybody. I know that because of just how my life was before I got saved. He doesn't just lead, lead everybody. But I believe those people who position the antenna and get yourself in place. And, 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 and I don't want to call these, these are the things you have to do because Paul's going around killing Christians and persecuting the church. And God interrupts his life and begins to direct him down the very purpose for his life. But what I am saying is that as you understand this gospel of grace, also understand that as a student of grace and as a Christian, I can begin to adjust my antenna and, and believe God's grace to help me to make those adjustments so I can be in a position to receive uh, more of God's transmission. So here's the first adjustment. Number one, I believe, I believe born again is important. I believe you've got to be born again. I believe that's important. We must be covenant children of God, I believe, before we can take advantage of being led by him, based on just what I just read. Being born again. And uh, St. John 3.3, 3, these are some, some pretty familiar scriptures, but I think we need to just take another look at them in light of what I'm talking about. John 3 and 3, Jesus was talking. He answered and he said unto him, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot, watch this, perceive, see, or have clarity of the kingdom of God. So there's something about you want clarity about God's ways. Uh, you want clarity about God's kingdom. He said, except a man be born again, something about your born again spirit that helps you to perceive and to have clarity of, of the things that God wants to do in your life. So a spiritually dead man cannot perceive the things of God. I do know that for a fact. A spiritually dead man cannot perceive perception of the things of God. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. 1 Corinthians 2 and 14. I want to give you a list so you can go home and begin to pray about it and allow the Holy Spirit to take this information and, and, and show you how to work with it. Verse 14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto a natural man, neither can he know them because they are what? Spiritually discerned. So even some things that God would speak to you as a natural man, not discerning it by the Spirit, you won't, you won't discern it anyway. You, you'll count it as something that's foolish anyway. God's telling you to forgive somebody that you got ought against. God's telling you to to walk in love with somebody you're not really fond of. See, these things are spiritually discerned, and he's just trying to position you in a place so he can direct, high, d direct your life. And then in Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, if you'll flip over there, Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, I, I hope you can tell that I'm, 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 I'm really, really believing God to help me to, to, to spend a lot of time getting you back focused in on the Word of God and getting you back focused in on what I'm saying. Let's see what the Word that goes with it so you can take it seriously and begin to, you know, get into this thing and realize that these, the, the interests of God's Word will bring light. Romans chapter 8, verse 14, uh, and he says this in verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So if you're born again, you're sons and daughters of God. It is God's full intent for you to be led by his spirit. He wants you to be led by spirit. So let's go ahead and release our faith right now. I am a son of God or a daughter of God. Go ahead and say it. I am. I am led by the spirit. That's God's will. God wants to lead you by his spirit. Man, check this out. God, you're no longer just going to be the t-shirt Christian. God is going to lead you by his spirit and he's going to teach you how to profit and he's going to teach you how to live this life. And up until this point, you've just been going by what you know with the Christian label. But, but now we're saying, it's, it, you know, this is a game changer. Now you're learning 
learning how to walk with your unseen partner. Now you're learning how to live life under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And you know, it's gonna, that's going to stop you from being on 285 for so much. So 285 goes around the city. And you just keep passing the same thing by 285. Honey, I'm here today to get you off 285 and show you there's an exit to the path and the will of God for your life. Amen? All right, so I believe born again is going to help you to receive directions from God. Now, here's what I'm excited about this morning. Uh, the, the second adjustment we need to make to our spiritual antenna uh, that I believe will help you to be led by the Spirit of God is, is learning how to, how to live a life of meekness. Meekness. It's something that we've heard as a part of the fruit of the Spirit, but I don't know if a lot of Christians re really understand how to live this life of meekness. When it comes to being led by the Spirit of God, I, I, I can't help but to think about Moses who uh, got this uh, assignment from God and he started at age 80. He absolutely had no idea how this works. He totally had to depend on God. Now, somebody said was Moses was, was perfect. Well, Moses wasn't. He, he killed a man. Uh, there was a lot of things he did, but God still chose him. And uh, the powerful thing about Moses, I love, is the fact that Moses depends on God. He knows he can't do it unless he's led by God. But Moses, it was kind of funny. The, at one time, I thought the Bible said that Moses was the meekest man in all the world. And I realized that Moses was the author of the book, so Moses said that about himself. <laughs> He, so he had to let us know somehow, hey man. But it showed me that meekness is probably a pretty powerful adjustment for us to make. I mean, if you just take note of how God led him, he led him through the, through the wilderness and led him through, all, through the Red Sea. And, 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 you know, how do you know to do all of this stuff except you be led by the Holy Spirit? Imagine what your life could be like if you're if you're knowing how to make the proper adjustments to be led by God, led by God to start a business, where to start it, when to start it, led by God to take that job or not take that job, led by God uh, to, for your mate and, and, even, and when you do get married, led by God on how to handle certain situations and not just handle it in a traditional way. This is a game changer for Christians. For a Christian people who are spirit-fed and spirit-led people, you're going to find yourself being taught how to profit. You're going to find yourself winning in this game of life because you understand that you, you have access to being led by the Spirit of God. Well, let's start here in Psalms 25 and verse 9. What does the Bible say here about uh, this area of meekness? Let's, let's see what it is. Let's see if we can break this down enough so that you can challenge your life to begin to live a, a meek life. Verse 9 in Psalm 25 says that um, the meek will be, the meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. Well, that's what we're after, right? We want his guidance, and he wants, we want him to, to show us in the way. And he says, the meek, he will do that. The meek, he will do that. So I'm, I'm interested already. If, if the meek gets your guidance and if you show the meek the way, I, I, I want to know how to get into that. Well, let's go to Psalms 103 and 7. Psalms 103 and 7. I tell you, if I can get a, if I can get a church full of people, if I can get people here in church here in our e-church to, to get just radical about being led by the Spirit of God and and stop going ahead of the Holy Spirit, but allow the Holy Spirit to go ahead of you. That's what it means to yield to the Spirit of God. He goes ahead of you and you follow him, rather than you going ahead of the Holy Ghost and look back and see if he following you. I, I just think that we're living in a, in a time now where we come out on top because we're being led by the Holy Spirit and we're yielding to him rather than uh, yielding to what we think is a good idea. Yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes good ideas are not God ideas. And I would prefer to have God ideas because they're already anointed versus having good ideas where I got to go and pray and see if I can get God to touch it for me. <laughs> Rubber stamp this for me, God. Amen. So now look what he says, Psalms 103, verse, um, verse 7 here. Uh, he, he, he made known his ways unto Moses his acts unto the children of, of Israel. I, I, want, I want him to make his way known to me. 
That, sh that should really be the desire of every Christian in here. I, I want to know your way. I, I, listen, I, I don't know the way. It, it's like it's, it, we're finally going to submit ourselves to God to a point where we say, I don't know how to get there. You know, sometimes God can even show you what to do, but I don't know how to get there. And that's why I thought this was so important. Today I wanted to give some practical things. You're convinced that God has a path and a will for your life. I don't know how to get there. So God, show me the way. Show me how to get to that point. The Bible said that Moses was the meekest man in all of the earth, so he had access to the ways of God. And today you and I have access to the ways of God. Amen? So what is meekness and how does it operate? What is meekness? Let me show you one other scripture before I get into this. Ma Matthew chapter 5 real quick. Matthew chapter 5 and 5. Jesus is talking here and he says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, boy, this, 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 this subject of meekness is, I could probably pe preach a whole sermon on that because it's so, so very important. And yet we don't hear a lot about it in church. So meekness has a three-part definition. And I want to give this to you. Ready to write this down or have you want to do it. A person who is meek, number one, is self-controlled or slow to give or take offense. So when I say self-controlled, I'm, I'm really headed on this area of being slow to give or to take offense. You want to be meek, you want guidance. I'm going to, self-control is a gift. It, it, what it says is I won't allow my emotions to control me. I won't allow my emotions to take me where they don't need to go. I won't give offense and I won't take offense. Who has offended you and stop your anointing? Who has offended you and stop your progress? Who has offended you and moved the antenna where you're no longer getting the transmission? You used to hate it when the wind would blow in the antenna. Who has offended you to do that? And somehow or another, how, how is it that you benefit walking around offended? You know, I realize uh, a while back that, um, you know, I can't, nobody can offend me. I have to really get offended. I have to take offense. You know, people can do things, but you still have to take offense. And there's something about this meek person that says, no, I, I, neither will I give nor take offense. Stuff's going to happen to you all the time while you're on the earth. In this world, you shall have tribulation. They that live godly shall have trouble. Uh, I think a lot of time that stuff is to help us to mature and to grow so that what happened 10 years ago is not happening today because of our spiritual maturity. As believers under grace, the Word of God reminds us that we are no longer living under the law, but are to be led by the Spirit in all that we do. The Holy Spirit guides us and gives us a divine advantage in every aspect of our lives. If only we would receive it. If you are struggling with yielding to the guidance of your unseen partner, the Holy Spirit, or need a boost in your faith to follow Him, the five-message CD series, The Spirit-Led Life, is just for you. Receive it today for just 30 U.S. dollars. No weapon for the gift shall prosper. When you put your focus and consideration on what the Word says, then you'll begin to be spirit-led versus emotionally led. You have to get today's message, you guys. It's so powerful. It will literally change your life. Or you can combine this transformative series with the highly requested book, The Holy Spirit, Your Financial Advisor. This $50 bundle is available today for just $40. US Call now or visit the website on the screen to order. Five Teachers of Grace. Five days of fellowship and worship. A lifetime of victory. Grace Life 2020 featuring Creflo Dollar, Taffy Dollar, Michael Smith, Gregory Dickow, and Andrew Womack. It's eye open, it's heart open, it's just life changing experience. Come see what God's got to tell you. Grace message is just the message for today. They are rightly dividing the word of truth and they care about the hearts and the souls of all people. Don't miss it. We've been to every one of them. Don't miss it. Join us as we bring you Grace Life 2020, July 6th through the 10th. This will be another amazing event and seats will go fast. To register now, text Grace Life to 51. 
or visit us at creflodollarministries.org. We will see you soon. As we wrap up today's broadcast, I'd like to take a moment to pray for you. I don't ever want to take for granted that you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. There's no better way to embark upon a new stage in your life than to enter into a personal relationship with Christ. So if you want to become born again and begin an exciting, intimate relationship with Jesus, pray this prayer with me now. Heavenly Father, come into my heart. Save me. I receive you now by faith. And I declare in Jesus' name that I am saved. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want you to call the number on your screen. I've got some things I want to send you that will help you in your new walk with Christ. And I'll see you next time right here on Changing Your World. Whatever you need today, no matter how big or small, bring it before the Lord in prayer. You may request prayer today by phoning in or posting your prayer request online at creflodollarministries.org. Because of you, Creflo Dollar Ministries is providing a new understanding of grace and empowering change in the lives of millions of people every day. Thank you, partners and friends. Your love and financial support makes it possible to bring this message into millions of homes. I want to let you know that we have now started a Karis Daily live Bible study. We've been doing a Bible study every Tuesday night live for about two years, but now we have five days a week. We've varied the times so that we can accommodate anybody's schedule, and it's going to really be good. We're going to use our instructors from the school, and it'll be a blessing. So remember, we now have a Karis daily live Bible study five days a week. Beyond the Game with Tony and JB. Stories that need to be told. To the outside world, it looked like there was nothing happening. I, that wasn't true. It's things like that that happen all the time that the public doesn't know about. Your body has an expiration date. I'm in bed the day after my surgery. Brian says, Anthony, when is enough enough? Beyond the Game with Tony and JB. Stories you won't hear anywhere else. Viewer supported Gospel Truth TV is free to listeners and free of charge for your favorite teachers. This is what we're hearing from people just like you receiving these messages of God's unconditional love and grace. Your teachings are transforming my life. Thank you. When you give to Gospel Truth TV, you're changing your life and touching countless others around the world. Click the Give button at the top or text GIVE to 719-301-2552. Watching Victory Life Today with Al and Angie Burke. Welcome to Victory Life Today. I'm Al Burke. And I'm Angie Burke. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're going to be talking about keeping promises. 
Amen. And if we do or if we don't. I just always keep all my promises. Yeah, well, just you so know, you know, no, you know what you do? You don't make them. Amen. You're I, smart. I, I, don't. <laughs> you don't make promises. I, I don't make I say, well, possibly I'll be there. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh, you always do that. Well, if there's a way, I'll be there. You know, and people go, that's not an answer. Tell me if you're going to be there well, or not. I'm not making promises. I know. Well, actually, it's really smart. But we're going to talk today about how we can count on God's promises. Well, you know, this is one of the things. We make promises that we don't keep. Right. And we just flip them out there. And what happens is it cheapens God's promises to us. Because promises don't mean a whole lot. Yeah, God's promised this. Yeah, whatever, whatever. Nothing ever seems to work. And I know God promised it, but you know how that goes. And so it cheapens, but God will keep his promise. Yes. He doesn't necessarily put a time frame on it, which is. That's another story. Another subject, but he will, he will always keep his promises or he's not God. That's right. And there are reasons why we can say this with boldness. And I'm going to read it. Um, John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, that word truth, it's so cool, Al. It means an open and honest mind that is free from pretense, falsehood, and deceit. So here's what Jesus is saying. I have an open and honest mind. That's who I am. I am truth. I have a mind which is free from pretense, falsehood, and deceit. So he cannot even lie. He is truth. There is no lie in him. If there's anything that God is unable to do, it's to lie. Right? I mean, he cannot lie. So when he promises you something, he means it, and you can count on it. And you know I say God couldn't lie if he wanted to. Right. But I say it this way. If God... Uh, God's words are creative power. Mm -hmm. So if God said a lie, then what he said would happen. And then it wouldn't be a lie. In other words, oh, I get, I get it. if the lights were off in here right. and God lied and said, oh no, if the lights were on and God lied and said the lights are off, they would just come on. It doesn't, in other words, whatever God said will happen. They would just the, go off. You mean off, if he I'm said, sorry. Right, right. Yeah, it, yeah I'm sorry. Yeah, so, yeah. in other words, whatever God said, if he says something that's opposite of what's happening, it's more than he can't tell a lie. It's like the universe will automatically align itself with his words. Well, that's very true. So, he kept, couldn't lie if he wanted to because the universe would change in accordance with what he said. And that and that's a good word, but we have the word to count on, and he is faithful to his word, and he and will not absolutely. lie against his word. He won't. But we do have the father of lies. And I want to read this in John chapter 8, verse 44. Now, Jesus was rebuking actually new believers here. Okay. They just started believing in Jesus. And he said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he, the devil, lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So we know who tells the truth, and we know who tells a lie. So when God makes a promise to you, he He will keep it, because he is truth. And you know, as far as the promises in the Bible, some say there's 3,000, some say there's oh, yeah. over 5,000. But I'll tell you what, whatever the amount is, that's a good amount, and every one of them is for you. Yeah, amen. Every one of Everything them. God does is for your benefit. Yes. Everything. It, you know, whoever whoever you are. And and so all those promises are for you. Right. God will live without those promises. He's the promise giver. Right. He's he lives either way, you know. I used to say things like, look, if you if you sin, trust me, heaven isn't going to fall apart. Right. You know what I mean? God is the promise giver amen. and he will keep his promises he always. That's what sets him apart. He, That's he won't lie. He, He's he, got a bit of integrity. <laughs> yeah, you might say it that way. <laughs> What's the second reason Al, God keeps his promises? We could. This is in 2 Corinthians one twenty. Uh, for all the promises of God in him are yes and amen. So yes and amen, it's an absolute trust, the confidence. But yes and amen means all of God's promises are going to happen. Every promise in the Bible will eventually happen if it hasn't already happened. 
And any promise God's ever made to you will happen. The promise right. still stands. Right. Any personal promise that God has given to you or to me will happen if we agree with it and we receive it as a promise. And so God's going to do this in my life. So all you got to do is That's receive good. it. And when the promise is fulfilled, he gets the glory. Yeah. Mm-hmm. which he deserves anyway. It's, he does his thing. <laughs> so the purpose of promises. Well, it's, it, it, it strengthens you in a hard time because you got a promise. And in the midst of a difficult, difficult thing, you say, no, I've got the promises of God. I will come through this difficult time. I will be on the other side of this someday. Wow. This is temporary. That's good. That's good. Well, remember how how we stood on the promises of God when you broke your hip? Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. We you know, we took first Peter two twenty four by your stripes. He's healed. We are healed. You and sent your word and healed them. That's There's right. There's a lot of healing. That's scriptures. Psalm one oh seven twenty. We yeah. what about uh second Corinthians four eighteen, which is one that we really stood on? These yeah. things that I see are temporary and what I don't see that what I do not see is eternal. So we had a, you and I had to focus on the, the that, those, right, yeah. right. And, and those were his promises that we could not yet see in the natural. Right. But we know it's going to happen and we stand on that promise. We yes. don't stand on what we see. We stand on what God has said. That's right. And, you know, right. sometimes what God has said doesn't seem all that likely or possible. But we stand on what he said because in time, and I don't know how much time, but in time, it will all happen. Well, that's that leads me right into the next thing because I was just going to say, you may say that you know some of his promises. You've been speaking some of his promises. You believe you believe those promises, and I believe you do too. But they're not happening in your life. What's taking so long? Well, first of all, we could never put God on a time clock. Okay, I I always said that because I want to do a whole thing on this, Al, because even Jesus kept saying over and over again, my timing has not yet come. God the Father had a timing for Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, you really got to get over yourself and, and just realize that this is going to come. Forget the timing, you know? I wish we could... Get, move God along on the timing thing, but we yeah. can't. You know, God's got his timetable. He's going to do. His promises are sure. That's They'll right. happen, but you may have to wait. And usually when you're waiting, it you grow in perseverance. And yeah, patience. there's a lot of good things that could happen. Let's look at John 14, 16 to 18. It says, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another counselor that he may be with you forever. Ever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, for it does not see him, neither does it know him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you fatherless, I will come to you. So here Jesus is promising them that he would never leave them and that he is coming back in the form of the Holy Spirit to live inside of them. Mm-hmm. Now, here's what they're told to do. This is this is the part where The waiting comes in. Here's what they're told to do. Okay, I gave you a promise. Now I'm going to tell you to do something. And I don't want to say that promises always happen only if you do something. But if God tells you to do something in order for a promise, you don't even know that that promise might be fulfilled if he just tells you to do something. That's why it's always smart to just be in obedience. But in Acts 1, 4... It's, he says this, being assembled with them. Now, he told them this. He commanded them, do not depart from Jerusalem. That was the first order. But wait for the promise of the Father of which you have heard from me, which is the Holy Spirit, which is what he was just telling them he was going to send them. So they go up into this upper room, and the Bible says 120 people were there, but there were many, many, many more people. They are hanging around inside, hanging around sure. outside, because they heard this promise, and they wanted to see it. And in chapter 2 of Acts, the Holy Spirit comes. But the thing is, it took 10 days 
from when Jesus spoke to them. It didn't happen immediately. And I have a theory or, or think why I believe that to be so, because I just believe God was filtering out all the people that just were not serious, did not really care, was there with wrong mo- motives, maybe to see yeah, some something of them were miraculous. Just curious. Just curious, not really even believing in Jesus, just maybe testing him to see that it wouldn't come to pass. How many times do we go to the Bible or used to, uh, you know, to prove it wrong? And then, you know, and these people, some of them might have been there for that. Some of them might have just gotten tired. Some of them might have just needed to go home, whatever, you know, I'm not putting them all down. But what I'm saying is, it seems to me that God was filtering out the ones, and when they left, only the serious ones, the diligent ones, the ones that really wanted to see this promise come to pass was there. They were left. And that's when the Holy Spirit came. But it took some time. You know what else? God doesn't live in time. No. So when he sends something, we're in time and there's like a disconnect. So we don't always know. God could be saying yes and answering that prayer, but you don't see the answer for years. Or like here, God says, stay there. I'm coming. They were like, tomorrow he's coming or tonight. Ten days later, it's like, well, did he forget? Well, that's very true. You, you, and you give up. You give up. You give up. And, and man, if you're, if you are waiting for something to happen in your life, do not give up on the problems. And I, I would just suggest something right now that you would ask God for a personal promise for you. In whatever situation you're going through, whatever trial you may be going through, you need a promise from God. Yeah, you have his whole word, but maybe you need something specific. For you, just ask him to give you a promise and he will do that. And then don't give up on that promise. I've got promises for all my kids. I never asked for them and my grandchildren. I never asked for them until this day. I stand on those promises. I will see every single one come to pass. And I'm seeing it slowly we in my life. To, but I'm um, seeing why don't we pray for the people out there that their promises uh, that, Go ahead. That'll be that great. promise to be met. I, 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 okay. Uh, let, let's pray. Absolutely. Let's pray. Uh, Father, I pray for anyone today listening who is saying, yes, please, I need a promise, Lord. I need a word from you. Where I'm going to pray for you right now, and I'm going to say this. I'm going to say, Father, I pray for you, whoever you are, that, Father, you would send something wherever they are wherever they might be that you would send it to them in a way that they can understand it and in a way that they can hear it that you would bless your people with this promise and that whoever hears this or maybe many people hearing this god has promises for you he has promises for everyone he has a destiny and a plan and whatever you're going through be it good or bad i'm praying for you god bring the promise into their life and then show them the promise and make it come to pass in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And now what I feel is that, you know, you can't afford not to stand on a promise. We all need that hope and you have the word of God in front of you where you can open it up and it's full of his promises. Take it anyone you want, but sometimes he just pours that promise into your heart, you know, without even like reading. Becomes revelation to you. Yeah. That's what happened to me. And he used people doing it for the most part in my life, but I have them and I never forgot them. And Al, when I saw oh, my kids were growing up and I saw things going wrong or not right. And I'm going, you know what? I always went back to that promise. I will not get off track because let me just tell you something. That's the devil lying to you that this this is never going to work. You just heard it out of your own wanting to hear it. No, no, no. That was God. And he showed me it was God. And the devil wants you to believe that it wasn't and it's all fake and it will never happen. If you give in to him, then it probably won't happen. God will make, will make a promise to you. God is a promise keeper, promise giver and a promise keeper. But he will not go past your will. 
you have to receive the promise. You have to say, yes, Lord, I believe that promise and I believe that promise is for me. Any promise in the Bible is for you. you. He may have a personal promise for you, but anything that's in the, in the Bible is a promise to you. And as you said, you have to receive it, but sometimes you're going to have to stand and you're going to have to fight because the devil's going to try to steal the promise away from you. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God is a promise giver and a promise keeper. You the promise and then just as you said the devil comes along and says it's never going to happen yeah. you know God's a good guy but you know it's, 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 it's okay just forget that just go on with your life mm -hmm. just forget that and he will try to talk you out of it and once he the devil can't do anything he has to have your permission to do it mm -hmm. He and, and you have to give it to him and when you when you just release the promise as in, I don't want this anymore. It's not going to happen. The devil's got you. He stole wow. the promise from you. Yeah. And because you just went, oh, I don't know, and walked away. Yeah. You know, there's a man that uh, God had promised him. He was actually an accountant. And he was ministering in a small, he had a small little church and he was ministering. And it, he was just having so many problems. And God gave him this vision of this church. Like he saw the picture and uh, he kept going on, but he didn't stick with this promise, the picture, this vision God gave him of what this church was going to look like someday. Uh, it, that was his promise. He didn't stay with the promise. He burned out. He said, you know what? This isn't going in. What he wants to do. Wow. We screw up the promise. Yeah. Just believe it. And if he tells you to do something, do it. In the meantime, That's right. nothing matters. You know, um, if Are you don't see the manifestation, just keep believing. Well, I haven't seen, you know, we have a new granddaughter. She's 11 months now. And before she was born, the Lord told me she was going to be athletic. And you might say, well, that's not a promise, but he told me that's what we was going to be. But then the promise was she is going to hunger and thirst after righteousness and lead many. Now, now she's only 11 months. months. So I got a long time to wait on this promise, okay? <laughs> and I'm good with that because as long as I'm alive, every single day, my prayer is to prepare my granddaughter to hunger and thirst after righteousness because you have to pray. You have to pray these things to to work and to manifest too. Hunger and thirst after righteousness and to lead many. Lord, keep her on the right path. Train her in the way that she should go. Give her parents the wisdom they need to train her up that way. And that's what I do every day for all of my children and grandchildren. You believe the promise and then pray the promise over them. Absolutely. And I want to tell you something else that I've noticed over the years. Sometimes it seems just like it's about to happen and then it all falls apart. Yeah. It doesn't mean anything. You just keep going. Just because it fell apart. For whatever reason, the devil got in there or you screwed it up. It doesn't matter. When If, if you're moving toward the promise, you see it coming and then it all falls apart. Don't think, oh, I missed it. It's over. See... You know, I see something in one of my children, and I won't go into it, but I, I, I see heading on a, his perfect path, awesome, awesome, awesome. Now I see a little bit of a possibility, not of going backwards, no way, but uh, maybe a, a temptation that the devil may throw in front of this, my, my kid. And uh, I, I see I'm on it. 
I'm on it because I want that promise manifested. And so I take my authority with the enemy over, over them. And I say, no, you are not permitted to bring distraction where, where they're off of God's path. And then I ask the Holy Spirit to put him back on the path. You have to be on it. You have to watch. You have to be alert. Yeah, you've got to do that. And sometimes you may feel as though you're seeing everything go wrong and you're thinking it's not going to happen. Don't worry about it. That doesn't mean anything. The devil's trying to, like in your, in, in what you're saying, trying to get them off of what God's plan is. But you stand on the promise no matter what it looks like. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because all his promises are yes and amen. And he he cannot say no to something he already said yes to. <laughs> okay, so if he says yes to healing, he can't say no, I can't heal you. If he says yes to I will never leave you or forsake you, he can't say no, I'm not going to be with you. He can't do that. He, he just can't. He won't go against his word, and he can't. And First Peter two twenty four, I love that. By his stripes I am healed. He can't. He can't go against his own word. He won't do it. What about prosperity? We're promised. We are promised prosperity. Mm -hmm. There are things we have to do. There, there. Uh, uh, you know, he'll lead you on a path to the prosperity. Right. But it's already in his mind. He wants prosperity for you. And one of the things what the devil does is to get you off of that is he gets, he puts people in your way that's, that's not true, that will say things that are contrary to what the scripture says. Yeah. And sometimes they're a pastor or someone that you would respect or someone you think knows a lot about God saying the wrong thing and you just accept it and you'll never get there once yeah. you reject I'm not going to say reject the promise, but once you see something in the Bible that says, I wish that, you know, in third John and two, beloved, I wished above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. So, and, and mayest prosper. In other words, you will prosper if you do what God is showing you to do. Right. It, it, right. And, and uh, don't a... let someone steal it. And this is what right. I've seen. The people come against the prosperity message. That's a promise from God, the That's prosperity right. message. And I'll tell you something. You can be as poor as you want to be, and God will love you. It's fine with God. It's fine with me. You That's can right. be as rich as you want to be, and God will love you. It's that simple. It's just the thing that scares the devil more than anything is a committed Christian with money. Because <laughs> they actually do something with it. Wow. Well, That's true. That's a promise. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's show. We thank you for joining us. And remember, victory is always yours through Jesus Christ. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching today. We have a special offer just for you. Our three best-selling books are available now as a limited time bundle at a special price. Clearing Up Misunderstood Scriptures, where Al and I share the misconception of familiar Bible passages and the victory you can experience when you understand God's Word correctly. In God's Not Mad at You, you'll be encouraged as you discover that God doesn't hold your sins against you, ever. What was done at the cross was done once and for all for you. And walking by faith into prosperity, Al covers three simple truths that will put you in position to release financial blessings into your life. Go to VictoryLifeMinistries.org and get the bestseller book bundle today. Al and Angie Burke are the founders of Victory Life Ministries, an organization that is designed to help you live your best life. You would be inspired to know that God will fulfill all of your needs according to His purpose. Live a life set ablaze by faith, filled with purpose. Live life above your circumstance.
want to dive deeper into the Word, but your busy schedule robs you of that opportunity, now you can listen to the Gospel Truth wherever you go with the Gospel Truth radio app. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, We are broadcasting the gospel, not only our individual television programs, but we've got conferences on there, and it's great. No matter how your time is divided up each day, now you can plug into the gospel truth 24-7 at your convenience. It's a great way to stay connected in a world that demands so much of your time. Tap the app and start listening to Gospel Truth Radio. Go to the App Store and type in Gospel Truth Radio and download it to your smartphone. Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I'm glad that you're watching our Gospel Truth TV. I tell you, this has been a blessing. You know, if you are being touched by these programmers that we have on here, I would encourage you to support them. Did you know we don't charge any of the programmers? If you appreciate that, I encourage you to be a part of it. Join us, support Gospel Truth TV, and also support the programmers. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. We have a better covenant upon better promises, and we have a better relationship with God. All these things we strive for and work for and hope for and pray for, we already have those things because Jesus gave it all to us. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday broadcast of the gospel truth. Today I'm continuing to teach on a subject that I've entitled A Better Way to Pray. And I tell you, I have uh, books on this. This is my English and then this is the Spanish version of that. We also have this study guide. And I haven't mentioned this a lot, but the study guide is just powerful. You know, the Lord has really put on my heart about making disciples. And it's one thing to get the book and read it yourself. But you need to share these truths with other people. And that's primarily what this study guide is for. It's just real simple. It takes uh, these radical statements. Like I've made a lot of radical statements talking about prayer. And you just read a few paragraphs. And then there's questions. And you discuss things. It's not a right or wrong answer. You just... You know, what do you believe about this? Do you believe that you can speak to the mountain instead of talk to God about your mountain? And you just discuss it. No right or wrong answers. And then you go back and read the scriptures and the scriptures answer it. And it's just an interactive way of sharing these truths with Sunday school class, Bible study or something. And it's a it's a great way to share it. And it would really be a blessing to you and to the people that you discipled. And then we also have DVDs and CDs on this. I'm now into my final teaching in this series, and that's entitled, Prayer is a Process. And I tell you, this is something that the Lord showed me decades ago. And this has become a foundational truth in my life. And this is one of the most important things that I've learned about prayer. Now, let me say again, I've already said these things in the previous weeks of teaching on this, that I believe that the primary purpose of prayer should be just to love God and to worship Him, fellowship with Him. And it should be a small part of our prayer life to pray and get needs. Meant. Now, I believe that that's really important to focus on that. I've already made those points, but... I'm going to be talking today about how to receive from God, how to get your needs met, and how to see prayers answered. But I just don't want to present that as this is the main part of prayer. It is a part of prayer. Jesus said that hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be made full. There's nothing wrong with you asking and receiving. But if we kept our priorities, Authority's right, and if we were really worshiping God and loving God, fellowshipping with Him the way that we should, you'd find that if you put first the kingdom of God, 
and His righteousness, then all of these other things would be added unto us. Matthew 6, 33. And the things that He's talking about are what you're clothed with, what you eat, where you sleep. Your physical things would come as a byproduct because most people aren't putting first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and they are putting first what they eat, and where they sleep, and all of these things, then it becomes a struggle, and it's hard. But if you would do things in its proper order, then all of these blessings would just come upon you and overtake you, and you wouldn't be struggling. So before I teach on how to get your answers to prayer manifest and to do these things, Again, I just want to say that we need to keep things in its proper priority. And if we put God and His kingdom first, then all of these things would come as a byproduct. I want to go back over to Luke chapter 11. I've already used these verses when I was talking about the man who, uh, you know, needed some food for a friend who had come in the middle of the night and he went to his friend and asked him for help. And the guy said, you know, I'm in bed. Leave me alone. And that has been mistaught that we just have to badger God. Instead, God was using this parable as a contrast to say, you can't imagine a friend who would treat you this way. Well, then why do you think that God would be hesitant to meet our needs? And he goes on to say that he will avenge us speedily. He will answer our prayers. And right in the context, I've already used these verses, but I want to go back to this. In Luke chapter 11 and in verse 9, he says, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Now remember that this is a contrast. And he's saying, I'm not like this so-called friend who wouldn't get up because it was inconvenient for him. He says, If you ask me, you ask, you do receive. If you knock, it's opened unto you. If you seek, you find. And so he's making this contrast. And I just want to take this verse... And, you know, this right here says that when we ask, we receive. When we seek, we find. When we knock, it is opened unto us. But did you know that not very many people really believe this verse? And primarily because they have asked for something and they didn't see what they asked for come to pass. They have sought to have something happen in their life and they didn't see it come to pass. They have knocked and they've asked God for something and they didn't see it come to pass. I can tell you there's things in my life. You know, when I was young, my dad was sick and he spent months in the hospital and I prayed for him every day and believed that he was going to be healed and I was totally shocked when he died just a few days after my 12th birthday. And so I've got things in my life that I've prayed for and I did not see come to pass. I was with a girl that died, and she strangled on her own blood. She hemorrhaged and, and choked. And I stood there for two hours praying for her to come back to life, and she didn't come back to life. I was with a little baby who uh, died in my arms, and I prayed for a couple hours and didn't come back to life. I saw at least four people that I prayed for who died and did not come back to life before I saw my first person it was raised from the dead. I've now seen four people raised from the dead. But, you know, I, I, I've had experiences where I prayed for something and I didn't see it come to pass. And the sad fact is that most people let their circumstances dictate what they believe more than what the Word of God says. What I'm saying is right here it says, ask and you receive. Well, I asked and I didn't see my prayer come to pass. So does that mean that this didn't work? I'm going to present to you and I'm going to explain this, that God has answered every prayer that was prayed according to the Word of God. Now, that's the only qualification I'll put on it. It says over in James chapter 4, it says, You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you might consume it upon your own lust. It also says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, it says this is a confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, we know that He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, then whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we've desired of Him. So I believe that the Scripture does teach that you just can't pray for whatever. It has to be something that is according to God's will. If you don't like the marriage that you're in and so you're lusting after somebody else and you're wanting to get divorced 
and remarried, God's not going to help you do that because that's contrary to his will. He did not provide adultery in the atonement. If you are desiring to rob a bank and get away with it, you can't pray for that because God didn't provide thievery for you in the atonement. So it does have to be according to his will. But when you pray for something that is based on a promise of God's word, God answered your prayer. And I know some of you are thinking, no, he didn't. I, I can show you the burial site where this person died. I can show you that I was evicted from this apartment, that my 